Alright, hello, hello everyone. A pleasant afternoon to all of our YouTube viewers. Welcome to Stack League University Series, Bulacan State University Edition. I am King and I will be your host for this afternoon. But before anything else, I would like to remind everyone that if you have any questions with regards to our session for today, you can type them in in the comment section and we will be addressing them later at the Q&A session. Alright, so before anything else, before we go to our main event, we would like to give you an overview of Stack League, especially if it's your first time to join a Stack League event. So Stack League, um, now in its second competitive year, Stack League wouldn't be possible without the support of our partners. And we're very fortunate and we're very glad to be supported by the top programmers or top companies in the industry. So we have our platinum sponsor, Packetworks. We have our silver sponsor, the Coding Chiefs. And bronze sponsors, we have Microsoft, Dell Tech Systems, Upper.ph, Recruit Bay, Gcash, Lika IT, and Manulife. And of course, we have our media partners. We have with SparkUp, Apps Gadget, Was Up Filipinas, Corner Magazine PH, Android Desk, Megabytes, Backend News, uh, Blue Wing, and Manila Republic. And of course, the same goes for our community partners who help the league reach as many programmers in the country as possible. So here they are. Okay, so one of the uh, one of the um, initiatives of Stack League is the Stack League Ambassador Program. And this month, uh, last month, August, we want to congratulate Lehan Carmona for being the Stack League Ambassador for the month of August, winning the 3,000 cash prize pool, a cash prize, and a Stack League t-shirt. So if you want to be the next Stack League Ambassador and win the cash prize and t-shirt, the program for September is still ongoing and you still have one week left for you to earn your ambassador points. And you can find the full mechanics at our website. It's bit.ly slash Stack League Ambassador 2022. And now to know more about Stack League, here is Haifa Karina from Stack League to give us an overview. Hello everyone, my name is Haifa and I will be giving you an overview of what Stack League is all about. Stack League is the Philippines' largest online programming league. The mission is to develop programming leaders that inspire a nation into coding. The tournament is powered by StackTrick's fully automated talent, analytics, and assessment platforms. Now, what are the highlights of the league, the pioneering programming league was launched last March 16, 2021, and is now gathering over 15,000 tech talents across the country to test their leadership, perseverance, and coding skills with a promise of nationwide media recognition, lots of prizes, thousands of tech job opportunities, and access to invitation-only events. The league's year-round cash prize pool is now at 10 million pesos in the duration of the whole competition that is for 2022 and one of the highlights in the stack league is the weekly stack race which is both for individual and teams each week the top 10 challengers and the top three teams are announced all across stack league social media platform to recognize the challenges who stayed on top of their rankings Apart from this, we also have the Stack League Featured Programmer and Team Campaign. The weekly top 10 challengers and top 3 teams are going to be featured on Stack League's website and on our social media channels. Now, Stack League will also be hosting numerous tech and career sessions all throughout the year. Aside from this, there are also exclusive trainings available for ranking to the next challenger levels and these events and trainings are all for free. So if you are interested in different industry trends, technologies, best practices, as a challenger in Stack League, you will have access to all of these learning sessions. Now, what's next? We also have the Stack League Ambassador Program, and it is a year-round initiative to reward Stack League challengers who go beyond the competition and inspire the nation into coding. To tell you more about the Stack League Ambassador, here is a short clip for you to watch.
All right. And that's for the Stack League Ambassador, wherein you will get, if you become the Ambassador of the Month, you will be receiving 3,000 pesos. And if you become the Ambassador of the Year, you will be receiving 20,000 pesos. And there are multiple ways for you to become a Stack League Ambassador. One is to really refer as many developers or interested developers to take on the challenges at Stack League, that's one. And then the other one is to post blogs or features using your own websites or other blog blogging platforms. That way you also get ambassador points. And now for the supported programming languages in the league, we have JavaScript, Java, Python, C Sharp, and PHP. Now how the, rank the ranking system goes. So, after signing up, you will have you will start at the bottom with zero points. All you need to do is solve as many challenges as you can and earn the corresponding points. So the more points you earn, the higher your ranking goes. Once you have accumulated enough points, you can now get to the next level. Uh, you've got the next level where most opportunities are unlocked for you. So there are three challenger levels. We have bronze silver and gold levels now the new thing that this year 2022 is that the challenger level up now has prizes so if you will able to unlock bronze level you will be receiving oh here you go you will be receiving 100 pesos so that's 100 pesos as soon as you level up to bronze then as you level up to silver you will be receiving another 100 pesos and when you reach gold, you will reach, uh, you will be receiving and rewarded with 300 pesos. So overall, you will be receiving a total of 500 pesos as you level up from unranked, bronze, silver, and then gold. Okay. So now if you become part of the be one of the 10 challengers to win this week. So on a weekly basis, we have rewards for the top 10. So there is also the Stack League Treasure Chest. That is what we call the initiative. We're in the weekly top 10 challengers will receive 500 pesos cash prize. What else? So there are a lot of things happening in Stack League, but this is also one of the highlights of Stack League for the year. We have what we call the Stack League Playoffs. So what is a playoffs? It is a single elimination tournament free featuring all monthly qualifiers where all weekly top 10 stack league challengers will automatically be invited to the monthly qualifier rounds. And you can read the mechanics at play, uh, stack league playoffs 2022 to know 2022. And to know more, here is another clip for you to watch. Okay. So as you can see here, we have the monthly qualifiers happening every month. And that happens, the playoffs monthly qualifiers happens every fourth Saturday of the month. So that's every um, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So every month we are giving away for the top one. We uh, The top one winner will be receiving 5,000 pesos. And the top two will be receiving 3,000 pesos. Pesos. Now, if you are interested in the schedule for the upcoming months, these are the schedules that we have. You can see them on your screen. Now, all of these players at the end of the year, by December, there will be a single elimination, as you can see the chart here, and the best players in the league will be crowned here through the, play uh, through the playoffs. And with that one, I give you the overview of Stack League. Now, Let's go back and welcome back our host. All right. So thank you, Haifa, for giving a short introduction of Stack League. So I know you guys are very much excited to 
uh, go on with our session for today. And wow, we have 850 viewers right now from YouTube. So hello again, guys, from our YouTube viewers. And uh, let's not delay this any further. Our uh, To introduce to you our first speaker, uh, he is one of the community leaders of Angular PH who is involved in organizing tech meetups, mentorships, um, and has written tutorials in his own website. It's sagevillafranca.com. He is the Auto Ot Zero ambassador and one of the Microsoft MVPs in the Philippines and has also been a speaker in several events um, and conferences both in the Philippines and abroad. He is currently a senior developer at Codev. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Seiji Villafranca. In your life. Thanks for inviting me again. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to share my knowledge again with the community and the students itself. Uh, in Stackling, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I think this is my third time talking with you. So it's really a pleasure for me to share again my knowledge with the community. And also, sa uh, Mulaka State University, so I was also invited by Sweets, uh, one of your uh, organizations, to share also um, my knowledge and ideas in one of the events. So it once again, it's really I'm really happy for being a speaker again with one of the events right now. So unfortunately, I uh, don't know in my life because of our time zone. So I'm not in the Netherlands, but I'm hoping soon that I'll be to talk to you in your life and I'll have um, a live interaction with you guys. So yeah. Um, Thank you again. So it's really an honor for me to be a speaker in the event right now. So yeah, as you can see, my as you can see in my screen. So our main topic nothing yet is about IoT. So IoT, IoT, IoT. So madalas natin na rin ito. It's what we know as Internet of Things. So scary guys. Uh, you might not know, or you might know that we're going to talk about IoT. So most of us actually, meron na tayong mga smartphones. I'm not really sure na uh, kung meron pa sa atin hindi yung magkakit na smartphones. But since we are all involved in tech, we are, I might sure that we are using smartphones already and that's considered as um, being connected as in, in the world of IoT. So you might not know also that uh, you are using smart appliances. So that is also considered, uh, or actually that's one of the basic examples of IoT. So, uh, I can say that Internet of Things is really now everywhere. So, sa kung saan na kayo magpunta, may possibility na makakita kayo ng gumagamit ng Internet of Things. So, right now, our topic is just a basic um, understanding of what is IoT and how, how IoT works and what are really the principles of building an IoT. So, it's discovering the emerging in the Internet of Things or the world of Internet of Things. Okay, so before I go on the topic, siguro, um, let me introduce myself first. So, okay. So, I'm CG Villafraca. Um, if you want to know more about me, if you want to know what are my works and what's my portfolio, so just go to cgvillafraca.com. Nandiyan uh, lahat ng mga ginawa ko. Well, not necessarily lahat, but some of my personal and freelance work uh, in my career. So just uh, go to my website, so it's cgvillafraca.com. And not just also my portfolio, I also have my contents and tutorials there when it comes to web and mobile development. So kung gusto niyo matuto ng web and mobile, uh, yeah, I have my tutorials there. And also my GitHub, so it's actually connected to my tutorials. So all of my codes um, are available in my GitHub. So you are actually free to pull it there. So if you want to try all the codes that I have created and at the same time um, imitate it or replicate it. So right now, I'm a senior developer from Waipun Technologies Netherlands. So, so I currently live here in the Netherlands. That's why um, it's sad that I cannot join you for now because of my time zone. So I have an office work here with your time. So, but soon, I wish na makasama ko kayo live. And also, I'm a Microsoft MVP. So what I do on Microsoft MVP is I share um, 
topics just like this. So I share my knowledge and ideas, not just in Microsoft, but also in web uh, development. So also I'm on Auth0 Ambassador. So I'm just saying on Microsoft and BP, I also share stuff and ideas, but uh, related now to security. So uh, next is also I'm a community lead of Angular PH. As uh, an Angular community lead, I uh, organize events and meetups also, just like this, what we are doing right now. So I invite speakers for you students and professionals to learn about, uh, learn more about technology from uh, our experts and masters in tech. Um, in tech. And also, I'm an author. So I'm going to go with that. So the uh, book I'm writing, so it will be published in October. So it's about um, Java, Spring, and Angular. So if you want to learn about full stack development using Angular and Spring, so yeah, you can get my uh, book. Okay. So these are just some of my past talks. So if you want to ask me how many talks that I've been, so I cannot answer that directly. So marami na ako ng talks sa uh, career ko. So it's, I think it's around uh, 50 plus, I'm not sure. But yeah, madami na And I've been to many places right now and uh, communities and events, so like that. So ito lang yung mga, some of the events that uh, I've been a speaker. Okay, so enough about myself. So let's just go to the topic, which is IoT. So the first question is, what is IoT? What the heck is it? So uh, to explain in a nutshell, IoT is the concept of connecting devices. So pagkakonnect connect natin yung devices and iaalaw natin sila makipag-communicate. So as long as it has an off, on, on or off switch, and it can connect to the internet with other devices. So that's basically what IoT stands for. So for example, in this house, I can see a plant, I can see a light, I can see a table here, I can see the TV. So as long as they have an on, off switch, so they can communicate with each other. So even a plant, so pwede natin siyang, uh, pwede natin siyang consider as IoT as long as it can we can embed a sensor or a microcontroller on it. So, ganun siya. Uh, kung ano yung nakikita natin mga bagay sa paligid, pwede natin siya consider as IoT. Okay. So, one basic example is if you have a smartwatch. So, I guess, guys, meron sa inyo yung sumagamit na smartwatch. So, that's already considered as an IoT. So, it can actually communicate uh, with other devices. At the same time, it can monitor your stress levels. It can monitor your... Um, blood pressure, you can monitor your sleep. So that's just one of the basic functionalities of having a smartwatch. So other than that, of uh, other than the monitoring features, so as I said, uh, na siya to communicate with other devices. So some smartwatch, they're actually more, uh, they're actually smarter uh, compared to other smartwatches. So they can actually communicate with other devices. They can collect data and information, or they can actually transmit information to other objects. So for example, um, you're a student or you're an employee, so you have to wake up at 7 a.m. So you watch more is have a scheduling uh, feature. So there's a scheduling feature of your uh, smartwatch. So for example, 7 a.m. So it will tell the coffee maker to make a coffee because it's 7 a.m. So to prepare yourself for your um, for your morning. So it will make a coffee maker because of the smartwatch. Then other than that, the second uh, thing it can do, it can it can actually transmit to the microwave oven itself also. So the microwave oven, so the, the microwave oven will cook or will be um, will turn on and will cook the lunch for you. So for example it's um it's already twelve it's already twelve PM so the twelve, um, the the watch will send a signal that hey, my grief, you should cook a food for, um, uh, for lunch. So um, basically, it transmits data to um, the microwave to have its own decision. Then the next is light bulb. So this is actually the basic example. So nagita natin to usually kay um, Alexa or kay um, kay uh, Google. So sa Echo. So, pwede tayo makipag-communicate uh, through turning on and off uh, the light bulbs. So, for example, in night time, so the, the watch can also send signals or send um, information to the light bulbs. 
and T, you should open out the lights because it's already night time. So for example, around um, 7 p.m. So it's already night time, it's already dark. So it can send um, information that the light bulb should turn on. So that's just a basic example of IoT. Okay, so sharing a lot of useful data between devices. So I think it's just a um, basic information or basic definition of IoT. So, ano ba yung mga pwede natin i-consider or pwede natin include na objects sa IoT? So, the first one is cars. So, Tesla. So, they are considered Internet of Everything since they connect um, different devices in the Internet. So, cars is uh, really um, ad advancing in terms of the technology right now. So, it's because of the Internet of Things. The second one is the smartwatches. So, uh, as the example I've shown you a while ago. And the third one, kitchen appliances. So, kitchen appliances, marami na nang gumagamit ng IoT. So, from uh, LG to Samsung, they're already creating IoT devices in kitchen appliances. The fourth one is the shoes. So, not just um, appliances, not just uh, electric devices, but we can also apply IoT um, in wearables so such as shoes so si shoes is pwede magbibigyan ko mamaya na example so kung parang nila ginawang IOT si shoes and lastly it's anything that you can imagine so lahat ng objects na nakikita natin sa bahay natin so you, it, it's a possible it's, it's really possible to make it as an internet of thing or IOT so ganun na ka-advanced yung technology natin when it comes to connecting devices with each other so, uh, I have a question for you guys. So, kung nakita niyo na itong uh, symbol na to, I guess you're really familiar with this series. And this series, it's really a good or a great example of Internet of Things. Um, it's kind of really advanced compared of the technology that we have uh, right now in the present. But as you watch through the series, is makita niyo uh, similarities or makita niyo yung pattern na, hey, this can be possible with the technology that we have right now. It's kind of scary, but um, it's really a great series on how can they how, how they depict uh, how the uh, how can technology can reach further. So uh, they also illustrate the uh, the internet or how powerful it is. So how can it affect the lives of people when it comes to using this uh, internet of things? So this is a series called Black Mirror. So if you have time watching it, guys, it's really a great, um, it's really a great anthology series. So um, in my opinion, I was really impressed on how the writers and how the writers came up with that kind of story when it comes to technological advancement. So for it, guys, it's really a great um, a series for me when it comes to uh, um, when it comes to technology. So yeah. So yeah, um, how does IoT or how does Internet uh, of Things started? So IoT, uh, it actually it actually it, it is actually existing around 1900s already. So hindi natin alam na nagawa na pala siya It's not that sophisticated as we have right now, but the concept of IoT is already existing around 1900s. So the first one. Um, it's the, the term IoT or Internet of Things came from Kevin Ashton. So he is from Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology or MIT. So one of the Ivy League schools in uh, the States or in the US. So he mentioned IoT on his presentation to PNG. So at a presentation at to sa PNG, um, he is proposing the use of RFID. So RFID is being used now in uh, payments or in toll gates. So it's actually a wireless communication uh, between the devices. So um, he mentioned IoT in his proposal. So because RFID is actually a kind of, or is actually a, um, under the category of IoT. So this is around 1900s, I think 1990, if I'm not mistaken. So Kevin Ashton introduced that term. But in 1999, so also Neil Gershenfield wrote a book named When Things Start to Think. So this is from 1999. 
So he doesn't directly mention the term Internet of Things, but when you see the title, when things start to think, so it's actually kind of an Internet of Things. So in his book, he's actually um, uh, displaying the concept of how uh, things or how objects decide or how they think uh, based on the data that they, uh, they acquire. So that's actually the concept of Internet of Things. So even though he didn't mention the IoT term, it's really the concept of how IoT works in the world. Okay. So, so before that, so Kevin Ashton, uh, Neil Dershenfield wrote a book and Kevin Ashton mentioned the IoT. But uh, it was in the 1990s. But we, did, uh, we don't know, but IoT is already existing in the 1970s. So, 1970 pa lang, meron ng gumagamit ng IoT or meron na talagang concept na nabuo. Okay, so the idea of connected device, nasa 1970s na siya. So, fun fact, ang first IoT machine, it was a Coke vending machine. So, Coca-Cola ang unang naka, may mga unang nakagawa, but si Coca-Cola ang unang nakaranas or na-experience ng uh, first IoT. Okay, so in Carnegie, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So, itong Coke machine, so people can check if the machine have a cold drink. So, it sounds kind of lazy, but they say that it actually saves time. So, ano hindi sabihin nun? So, instead of going to the Coke vending machine to check um, if a cold, if a, or if a drink rather is already cold or an empty drink, so they can check in their computers if the, the drink is already cold. So, the vending machine can notify the computers um, of the users that yung drink mo ay malamig na. So, basically, that's it. So, that's the cockpit, what the cockpit vending machine is doing. So, nagsisignal lang siya na, hey, ready na yung drink mo. So, I don't have to go there and check and check again if it's red red. So, that's really the IoT uh, in that vending machine. Okay. Then, um, after that, so that's the first uh, IoT. Then we have the end-to-end -end communication. So the end-to-end -end communication, uh, what it means, it means machine-to-machine -machine communication. So it's how uh, machines communicate with each other. So it's connecting devices to cloud. So they are now utilizing cloud to collect data or to transmit data from one another. Then we have the SCADA, or the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So it collects data in real time in remote locations. So ito yung mga may hirap puntahan. So they have embedded systems that is based on the remote locations and they will know the situation uh, in that specific location by collecting data with the embedded systems. So um, they know what's the situation that right there and they know the status of what is going on in that location. Next is the 2000, um, in the year 2000. So LG was actually one of the uh, one of the first companies that created a smart appliance. So this is a smart refrigerator. So this is in the year 2000. Then in 2007, so if you remember, so ito yung isa sa mga pinakasikat na launch na nangyari sa atin. And actually one of the big steps in technological advancement. So the first iPhone was launched. So why it was a big technological advancement? Because this is one this is the, one of the first smartphones that is being released um, in the industry so in, or in the market. So I, smartphones was really a big uh, step for technology as smartphones is really smart itself. So they have their own uh, functionalities like GPS. They have their own, um, they have their own applications, very sophisticated applications that can do a lot of things. So this was in year 2007. Then in 2009, Google started testing driverless cars. So it was not Tesla, but it was Google. So this was also really a big step for uh, for IoT or Internet of Things, uh, uh, such that uh, um, driverless cars, uh, this is really an advanced uh, technology. Then lastly, 2011, so that's um, Google Nest smart thermostat were created. So thermostats, they can actually detect the weather or the humidity. So 
um, they can have decisions on what uh, they will do to the temperature of your house. So they can maintain the uh, the heat, for example, or the temperature, for example, based on uh, the condition of the weather. So this was also from Google in around 2011. Okay, so after that, technological advancements in IoT. So COVID-19 has also a big, uh, it's also a big effect or uh, a big factor when it comes to the IoT advancement. So right now, uh, you see in our graph, so as the COVID-19 projection or the impact of COVID-19 projects up, so the use or the, um, the utilization of IoT also goes up. Why? Because IoT is really, um, it's really a big help or it's really a big advantage in terms of healthcare. So the uh, IoT uh, is really uh, a great weapon or impacts a lot when it comes to um, helping people in the field of healthcare. So uh, people utilize IoT a lot when the pandemic or the COVID-19 arises. So if you want to uh, watch or if you want to read more about this uh, article, so I've placed the link below. So it's the vision of humanity.org and what is the internet of things. Okay, so how does it work? So we know uh, where does IoT came from. So um, we, we can see uh, anywhere what uh, IoT. So we can see it in different places. But you might wonder, how do we get the internet of things or IoT? So for example, uh, we have a smart refrigerator. So how does the smart refrigerator collect data? So how does it connect the appliance na siya and it's wireless? You don't even uh, know where the data is uh, being transferred or being emitted. So how does it really work? So the first one is, it's a smart device that has embedded systems. So that embedded, embedded systems, it can be a form of a board. So this is the processors, the sensors, and the communication hardware. So these processors and sensors, these, has the these have the capability to collect data for that smart device. So they have the capability to collect data. And this data will be the uh, one being used to have to create decisions or to create, uh, to create uh, next steps for that specific smart device. Then, data passed by devices is analyzed to execute actions. So, yeah, the data the data in IoT, so the information or data it being collected, is one of the most important or the core factors when it comes to um, building Internet of Things. So, ito yung data that na analyze natin on what would be the next step for that certain smart device. And mostly ngayon, sa mga uh, IoT objects, so it was it it is actually now being aided by AI and machine learning. Bakit? to be smarter. So AI and machine learning they help um they help smart devices to decide more accurate. At the same time, they help devices to learn more about the data that they've been collected. So they are um, they can adjust and they can adapt to the data that is being collected um, by other devices. So this is one just example of IoT. So in 2015, we turn a light by turning on, off and on the switch by using our fingers. But right now, in uh, 2020, we just say to Alexa, you will hey, uh, Alexa, turn on the light. So this is one. This is just one example of IoT. So when you think of it, it seems kind of lazy, but this is not just about um, this is not just uh, the power of IoT. So, marami pang nagagawa ang IoT. So, it can really go beyond that kind of feature. So, this is just an example of an IoT system. So, um, sinasummarize lang natin kung ano yung ginagawa ni uh, for, or, or, or kung ano yung paano nag-work si IoT rather. So, yung kanina yung explain ko is mostly the same as this one. But it's more in a specific and uh, it's like in a, a flowchart manner. So in this case, the first one is the one that collects data. So the collection of data, so it it is done by using the IoT device. So that's the sensors, 
the antenna or the microcontrollers. And they're the one, um, they're, they're the one uh, who collects the data and the data that is being analyzed. Then the next one is, um, where does the data pass through? So, paano na ko communicate yung from one device to another device? So, this is done by using the IoT Hub or IoT Gateway. So, this is, um, the transfer of data is being, uh, is possible by using this gateways. Then, the last thing is the one that analyzes the data. So, yung nag analyze ng data para malaman natin kung ano yung next action or yung next step na gagawin ng smart device. So, this is done by, um, uh, smart notes or other user interfaces and also done by backend systems. So these are the one that holds the algorithms that analyzes the next uh, steps or the next decisions. Okay. So before proceeding guys again to my um, presentation, so I just want you to watch this uh, two minute video in IoT in involving agriculture. So how IoT helps the field of agriculture. Female presenters don't stand like this. So, okay. If you're a female, digital technology such as the Internet of Things is driving change in agriculture. So, what is the Internet of Things and what does it mean for farmers? The Internet of Things, or IoT, refers to devices or things that are embedded with a sensor so they can measure and transmit data via a network. Devices can mean anything from pumps, sheds, and tractors to weather stations. Essentially, IoT means these physical devices can send and receive information via the internet. On farms, IoT allows devices across a farm to measure all kinds of data remotely and provide this information to the farmer in real time. IoT devices can gather information like soil moisture, chemical application, dam levels, and livestock health, as well as monitor fences, vehicles, and weather. Information generated by IoT devices allows farmers to track farm operations and performance, make better informed decisions to improve farm productivity and yield, and respond more quickly to their conditions, saving time and money. It's putting the data behind the all-important farmer gut instinct, whether that be knowing when to check on water supply to a trough, how much fertilizer to apply to a crop, and which ewe to check during lambing. The Victorian government is committed to driving the uptake of digital technology, including IoT in agriculture. To support this, Agriculture Victoria is rolling out a $12 million on-farm Internet of Things trial. The trial is part of the government's plan to increase digital connectivity and usability in regional Victoria. IoT infrastructure is being set up in four trial regions to enable farmers in sheep, cropping, dairy, and horticulture to work with technology providers to investigate how IoT technology can benefit farmers. The trial will test the on-farm impact of IoT, support Victorian farms to become IoT enabled, and help place Victorian farmers at the forefront of the digital agriculture revolution. Are you ready to investigate the next frontier of agriculture? Find out how you can get involved at agriculture.vic.gov.au forward slash digital ag. Alright. Okay. So now you've seen um, the importance of IoT. So, kanina, nakita natin yung one example na si Abitis. It actually helped us in terms of turning on and off the light without um, um, pressing the switch, but it actually goes beyond there. So, see, IoT is also helping different fields. So, one best example is the agriculture. So, sa agriculture, as you can see in the example, is nakakapag help siya in terms of decision uh, making sa mga farmers. So, it actually um, saves their time, money, and resources. So, walang nasasayang their resources because of more accurate decisions such as um, it's because of um, they know the weather, uh, they know they know the soil, the, the status of the soil, so ano yung mga dapat i-produce, um, na, na products. So, 
makakatipid talaga sila and magkakaroon sila ng uh, more efficient way in terms of producing their goods. So, instead of just using their gut feeling as said in the video, so they're using data in, uh, in, in the next steps or they're using data to have uh, more accurate decisions in their farming. So, IoT is very important in different fields. So, other than agriculture, IoT is very important in several fields also. And, um, and one of the fields that are IoT is important is smart factories. So, why? Um, because smart factories right now is um, being used by many manufacturers. It's because of a more accurate quality or quality rather in terms of producing their products. So, um, in different uh, parts of the countries or in different countries. So it's because of um, it's because of the um, the more accurate uh, quantity and more accurate um, manufacturing. So these are actually just the, um, um, some of the top fields that is being helped by IoT. So the first one is healthcare. So as I mentioned a while ago, so COVID nineteen. So malaking tulong talaga ang um, idolot para naging uh, na, naging cost ni IoT. So sa healthcare. So it's real-time remote patient monitoring and robotic surgery. So monitoring actually is one of the basic examples of uh, uh, utilizing IoT in healthcare. So in terms of uh, monitoring your glucose, your hypertension, or your hypertension, or your um, um, stress levels. So that's one of the basic uh, usage of IoT when it comes to healthcare. Then next is in uh, Transportation also. So actually transportation, it's widely used uh, in our country, in the Philippines. So marami na rin gumagamit ng uh, internet things. So one example is license plate readers, uh, traffic counters, and uh, red light cameras. So they can actually collect data kung ano ba yung mga lugar na traffic. And for example, they have violations. So it's license plate readers. So it's um, really a good way in terms of um, making your transportation better. So, marami pang iba examples na uh, ginagamit si IoT when it comes to transportation. And lastly, ang sabi ko kanina, it's also about uh, in use by manufacturer. So, um, it's really advantageous for uh, companies uh, to have IoT when it comes to manufacturing their products. Okay. So, we know now kung ano yung mga pwede nating uh, itakil the fields when it comes to building IoT and uh, alam na natin kung ano yung mga pwede maitulong ni IoT in different fields uh, right now paano, paano kung gusto na natin mag-start, mag-build or mag-create ng sarili nating IoT na project so um, there, are many, there, there are many tools in terms of creating IoT or there are many um, there are many uh, available products that you can utilize in terms of developing your own IDT. But in this case, I will just show you the top uh, tools that you can use or that you can uh, utilize when it comes to developing your own IoT project. So, the first list that I will show you is about the framework. So, these are the frameworks that you can use for building your storage or building your cloud in storing your data in IoT. So, the first one is Azure IoT Suite. So, the Azure IoT Suite is really um, flexible. So, it's it's from Microsoft. So, many in offer the services in Azure like um, Cosmos DB or um, Azure Blob Storage for collecting data in your IoT. Then, the next one is Shepre, Amazon Web Services. So, it's just like Azure IoT Suite. So, it offers different... Uh, different lists or different, uh, wide range of services when it comes to building your IoT. Then next is IBM Watson. So IBM Watson is one of the uh, popular frameworks when it comes to building IoT. So marami yung ino offer na IBM, uh, si IBM uh, services, just like Amazon and Azure. And from what I remember, it's from IBM Bluebix, so you can use that as building your IoT. Then the fourth one is Oracle IoT. So it's also offering services for uh, building your Internet of Things. <coughs> Excuse me. And lastly is the KAA IoT. 
So KAT IoT, uh, if I would recommend uh, for the students uh, a free way of having tools or having framework, so I would recommend KAT IoT. So this is actually open source and free to use. So if you want to build or develop your um, IoT project, so I would recommend the IoT. So we have now our cloud service, we have now our database for storing data. So and now is what we need, the last thing we need is the IoT boards. So what are the IoT boards? So these are the embedded systems that we need to place in our devices. So ito yung mga nagko-collect ng data from other uh, devices or from other objects. So I'm, I might... Uh, I'm not sure, but I know if you I know if you heard of this one. So yung IoT boards like Raspberry Pi and Arduino. So I think mga madalas na ginagamit for IoT. So I think you're familiar with that already since um, these are these boards are actually uh, popular in terms of not just in IoT but also in robotics. So the first one, as I have said, it's Raspberry Pi. So Raspberry Pi R Raspberry Pi is very flexible and powerful. So you can integrate different languages such as uh, Python, so uh, JavaScript, so we can use uh, different languages to integrate or develop your IoT. So same as Arduino, it's also lightweight as the same, at the same time, it's flexible. And the ESP8266, so this can also be used um, for embedding microcontrollers for your devices. And lastly, the science hat and 8x8 RGB LED matrix. So the sense hat, it's um, actually used for detecting the temperature, the humidity, so um, anything that is related to the weather or the temperature. So we can use sense hat as a board. So kung gagawa kayo ng mga uh, IoT, uh, gusto mong detect ng temperature, so like sa mga thermostat, so you should use the sense hat 8x8. Okay, so kapag hindi ako what it looks like. So this is what it looks like right now. So that's the uh, the first one is the Raspberry Pi. So now I'm going to Raspberry Pi. I used it. I used it uh, for my robotics. At the same time, I got it for my IoT project. So um, it was really flexible. So one, um, uh, compatible with the programming language. So I also recommend using this Raspberry Pi. And the Arduino itself, and the ESP8266, and the Sense Hat 8x8. So, yeah, it's, it's a wide range, so marami pang ibang boards, but these are actually one of the of popular uh, boards that be, that is being used in terms of IoT. Okay, then next is, now we have our um, boards, we have our tools, we have all the things that we need in terms of building our um, Internet of Things. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, meron na tayong tools. But it doesn't necessarily mean na kailangan natin gumawa agad ng IoT. So, hindi na tayo basta gawa ng gawa. But we also have to follow some some or five main principles in terms of building IoT. So, we need to consider some things before um, building our own project. So, you can see there, Leonidas is screaming, this is big data. So, IoT is really a big data. So, since we have many devices communicating each other, it means that there are also many data that are being devised, uh, that, that are being transferred from one device to another. So the first one um, in the principle that we need to follow is develop an, an Internet of Things or IoT in the, um, the solution in the cloud. So see, Internet of Things, it's better to place it in the cloud. So clouds are actually available always and they're efficient and at the same time flexible. So it's a better um, it's really a better uh, practice for you to create your Internet of Things in the cloud. So, clouds are very um, sophisticated now, nowadays, so it's really a good option. It's, it's really a recommendation for us to utilize the cloud in IoT. So, lahat ngayon ng IoT, they're actually communicating uh, with the use of cloud. So, create an Internet Things of Platform. So, this platform are actually the user interface or um, the applications that allow us to analyze the data being transferred in the IoT. So, ito yung mga platforms na ginagamit to um, have analysis at the same time to see the data um, between the, that are being transferred between the 
devices. So, ito yung parang um, way natin para magkaroon ng illustrations dun sa mga data uh, na nakokolect na information or data. And the third one is organized high performance data streaming. So, um, you have an IoT, pero so bang bagal ng communication ng data. So, it, it is not really effective. So, para mas pinapatagal lang natin ng trabaho natin. So, it's really important for us to have a high performance data streaming. So, it's actually um, the same with the cloud. So, it's better for us to utilize the cloud to have um, different or wide range of services that can make the data streaming better. Then, the next is to ensure the safe collection of data. So, since IoT is also a big data, so maraming data ang dumadali or um, tinatransmit natin from one device to another. And this data can be critical at the same time it, it contains uh, critical information. So, if we, call, if we build IoT, so this is actually one of the most important principles. So, we need to ensure the safety of our data being transmitted. Then lastly is the effective data management. So, we are transferring data a lot, a very, very big amount of data. So, we should also manage the data wisely and at the same time effectively. So, kapag hindi natin manage ito ng maayos, it can also lead to corruption and downtimes in our IoT. Okay. So, we have the principles and now we need, we need to have the stages that we need to follow in order to build your IoT. So, the first one, is the hardware to use. So, yung, ano ba yung gagamitin yung hardware? For example, um, you're building um, a project for healthcare. So, for example, monitoring. So, gagamit pa kayo ng watch or gagamit pa kayo ng other devices. And at the same time, it's also included, this also includes the decision of what sensors or what microcontrollers that you need to use. So, this is imp an important stage. So, this is the first, first stage that we need to do. Then the next one is the centralized data storage. So this is also an important factor. So ano ba yung mga ano yung storage or ano yung services of storage na nagamitin natin when it comes to the collection of the data being uh, or the information or the data being collected. <coughs> next one is the server side for handling data algorithms. So we need to develop or we need to create our own server side um, or of, or our servers or our um, applications that will do the analysis. So, ito is um, ito yung isa sa din sa mga critical part. This um because this one this is the one who creates um analysis and the ones that will um make the decision the decisions for the devices. Ko ano yung next thing ang gagawin. And lastly, the front end. So the front end is actually the UI or the interface that will allow us um, that will uh, allow us to have an illustration of ano yung mga kinokollect natin data. So this is uh, this is actually helpful for us to identify kung ano ba yung mga nangyayari dun sa Internet of Things. Okay, so it's the hardware, um, it's the storage, it's the server that collects or that uh, creates the algorithms and lastly the front end so that's the four stages that you need to remember okay so there are really many industries uh, or fields that you can help in terms of building your own IoT so the first one is the retail so it's actually um actually marami nang gumagamit ng IoT when it comes to retail so it's like the smart shopping, the smart shelves, um, the, or the online deliveries for the online um, online shopping. So it's uh, IoT is really um, emerging when it comes to the retail. So healthcare also. So the monitoring systems, logistics for um, their asset tracking and asset management, and as well as smart cities. So these are some of the industries that you can uh, help when it comes to building our own I IoT projects. So, yeah. <coughs> uh, I mentioned the industries that you can uh, help. So, any mga possible projects na pwede nyo gawin? So, these are just some of my ideas or some of my knowledge. But, if meron pa kayong mas naiisip na mas maganda idea uh, dito sa mga nalistang ko, why not? Diba? 
Um, these are just some base. So, baka may mas maisip pa kayo na mas maganda base kung doon sa ideas na uh, na-come up ko. So, in retail, you can actually build a um, buyer behavior tracking. So, this is actually helpful for the um, producers or for the companies. So, what does buyer behavior tracking do? So, it analyzes what products are most bought. So, this can actually be a decision factor for the um for the companies, kung ano ba talaga yung mga products na dapat nila i-focus. So, this is really a good idea for uh, for companies and for retailers na, uh, na to save money, time, and resources when it um, comes to their products. Then, smart shelves. So, may gumagamit na rin ito. Uh, I think uh, it's what we call the Amazon Go. So, it's actually unbanned already. So, nade-detect na yung shelves kung ano yung mga nakukuha na products at the same time, ano yung mga dinadagda. So, it can actually keep track on the items without human intervention. And other than that, it can also prevent theft kasi may kita natin kung ano ba talaga yung mga nawawala dun sa asset nila or dun sa products nila dun sa shelves. So, it's an automated way of detecting the products or the number of products. The next is the traffic control. So, not traffic in the streets, but the traffic of the people inside the store. So, this is actually an idea for COVID-19. So, sa COVID-19 ngayon, syempre, minimintay natin yung uh, social distancing. So, ayaw natin mag-crowd or magkaroon ng uh, maraming tao doon sa store. So, we can have sensors in our um, groups. So, it can control the population in the store. So, if, for example, you have a limit of uh, 50 people in the store. So, if you have 51, is the traffic control will notify that hey, our store is being crowded already. So, we need to reduce down and um, let the people or other, con uh, other consumers wait outside. So, we can prevent the uh, COVID-19. So, other than traffic control, it can also um, detect kung ano yung situation ng mga tao doon. So, not just the traffic control. So, ano yung mga distance. So, ipapakita yung uh, ipaproject niya kung ano yung percentage ng no risk doon based on sa population na meron. So, these are just some of the uh, uh, good ideas that you can make in terms of the retail field or retail industry. Okay. <coughs> this week. Next one is the healthcare. So, na, madalas na mamang itong healthcare because this is actually one of the critical parts or the critical fields in the world today. It's lala na ngayon, maraming sakit na uh, kum kumakalat, especially the pandemic. So, IoT can really help this uh, field. So, in terms of healthcare, so we can do actually monitoring systems. So, monitoring systems, it can collect data from, from patients for an analysis on what medication or procedure they need. So, monitoring systems can really help nurses and doctors um, to decide more accurate on what are the treatments or what are the medications that they need to give um, to the patients. Kasi mas meron sila data na pinanggangalingan based on the patient's health. So, some of the monitoring systems, so it can actually monitor the hypertension, so the detect patterns on having hypertension. So, this monitoring system, so hindi lang niya dinedetect kung mayroon ng hypertension yung patient. But it can also detect the behavior of the patient. So, for example, I ate something today and tomorrow, the trigger niya hypertension. So, malalaman ng uh, monitoring system kung ano ba yung mga intake ko na possible na nag-cause ng hypertension. <coughs> Excuse me. Right now. Hypertension ko right now. So, this, this is really a great idea. Okay. Next is emotional pattern detection. So, it can also detect the activities that makes the person happy. So, it will tell the user uh, ano ba yung mga activities that makes me joyful. At the same time, ano ba yung mga activities that makes me more energetic. So, it's really a good uh, way of uh, finding out the activities na nakakapag uh, energize or nakakapag uh, bigay na happiness dun sa life ng isang tao. So, this is also a good idea. Sleep monitor. So, the sleep monitor tracks breathing and heart rate and snoring. So, um, this is uh, actually many devices already exist. But, in terms of improvement, so, we can add uh, some ways of, we can add some improvements like, ano yung mga uh, uh, 
uh, factors na nakakapag uh, nakakapag paganda ng sleep uh, natin. So, it's also like the emotional pattern uh, detection. So, it, it also detects the, um, the behavioral or the, um, the activities that we do to, to maintain um uh, to maintain our um, good sleep. So that's also one improvement that we can use in uh, the monitoring system for sleep monitor. Okay. <coughs> the next is the smart cities. So smart cities is smart cities is really a wide uh, a wide field or a wide uh, a wide industry. So it's actually um, composed of different uh, fields. So I can give you some projects or thesis ideas that we can work on in terms of smart cities. So the first one is the traffic monitoring. So the traffic monitoring is to monitor the traffic in places and the type of vehicles in a location. So this can actually help users a lot. So makita nila yung mga lugar na traffic. So they can actually um, they can actually prevent that place. At the same time, we can, this is going to also be used uh, or we can, can be helpful by LGU. So, bakit uh, makikita nila kung ano yung mga possible causes ng traffic dito? So, hindi lang traffic yung monitor niya, but yung mga um, scenarios or yung mga factors na nakukos ng traffic. And they can have several decisions or they can create decisions based on that certain scenarios. So, that's traffic monitoring. Next is the smart dumpsters. So smart dumpsters, so it's allow it allows for garbage collectors to tra track dumpsters based on their capacities. So para maiwasan natin yung overflowing at the same time yung uh, yung mga unnecessary na tinatap sa dumpsters. So this uh, they have we can create smart dumpsters. So na na detect niya kung uh, punong na ba yung dumpster natin at the same time is hindi tama yung pagsegregate ng mga trash. And lastly is the safety monitoring. So it can detect unusual behaviors and criminal activities that sense notification. So this is for the safety of the people. So the the monitoring system, it can detect um, criminal uh, criminal activities. So it will send um, signals or notifications to the um, to the police or to the LGU. So para, uh, para magkaroon ng actions or decisions when it comes to that kind of activities. Okay. Yeah, so we can see that uh, in that kind of projects that we can create, um, we can say that IoT is the hero. So it really creates a lot of advantages in our uh, in our daily life. So it can actually monitor your overall business process. So in, in terms of businesses and companies and retailers, it's actually an advantage. So it can also improve the customer experience. So um, other than just doing something manually, so mas mapapadali na rin by using IoT. We can communicate to the devices. So instead of doing this kind of work, so we can actually um, command the device to do the work for you. The next is save time and money. So as you see in the agriculture, nakaka-save sila ng resource at the same time ng uh, kanilang time and yung pera na na uh, ginagamit nila in terms of producing their goods. Enhance employee productivity, integrate and adapt business models, make better business decisions, and generate quality. So it's really an advantage when it comes to time, money, and resources. Okay. Then, yeah, we can say that IOT is a hero, but everything has its own disadvantage. So, pag napalag niyo yung Black Mirror, so we'll, you will see the the disadvantage of being always connected to the internet. So it also has a disadvantage since IoT is a big data. Um, it it consists a lot of transferring of data. So you can say that there's also a lot of hackers that will attempt to get that data, especially if it's critical. So the first disadvantage for it is the data breach. So more data coming through in, uh, in IoT. So the more risk you can have. So if it's especially if it's a critical data. So data breach is really um is really dominant or it's um, it's really uh it's really one of the uh risks in having an IoT since maraming data na tinatransmit. 
Second one is the dependence. So dependence, why? Um, really, um, devices are really dependent on each other. So kapag may possibility na nasira yung gateway or nasira yung mga uh, cloud mo, so pwede makurat lahat ng devices mo. So they're really dependent with each other. So many things may not work correctly now. Then third, the third one is the security and privacy concerns. So the security, same as data breach, so maraming data na tinatransmit. So possible na may, na, na uh, makuha or may retrieve ito ng mga hacker. So that's one concern also. And the fourth one is reduce mental and physical activity. So the one, um, one of the best example is the the picture I've shown you a while ago. So instead of maglakad pa tayo, mag-turn on and off ng switch, is itubutos na lang natin. So nawawala na tayo ng activities because the machine do the work for us. So that's one of the um, disadvantages of having IoT. So the key differences between IoT and traditional digital systems is really safety and security. So na increase natin yung potential cyber attack um, since it consists of big data being transferred, um, it's really prone for hacking. So if naka-access yung hackers mo sa mga systems mo, and it's really a risk for you that can, he can control anything uh, in the cloud, anything connected in the cloud. Then it's more lucrative for hackers to attack due to the amount and type of data from IoT. And it's actually more challenging to identify the root cause of security breach since maraming data or maraming devices rather um, involve sa IoT. So it is a hero, but it it also takes risk for us to create IoT. So that's why um, in my principles, in the five main principles, it's really important for us to consider security when it comes to developing IoT. Okay. So as I as Spiderman uh, said. So with great power comes with great responsibility. And it also applies. With great IoT comes with great responsibility. Because it has great advantages, but it also has disadvantages. Okay. So yeah, uh, I guess that's uh, the summary of my, or that's the, uh, that's the introduction of I IoT. So I've introduced you the projects of how IoT works and um, uh, the principles or the stages that we need to follow on building your IoT. So, sana may makuha kayong idea or sana may magamit kayong uh, project or thesis dun sa mga binigay topics. But if you want to learn more a technical side of IoT, so I can teach you that since we only have one hour. So, I also place some references here in my slides na pwede nyo gamitin in order for you to learn IoT. So, I'll give you the um the slide link so if you can also get all the links that is written here right so yeah thanks um thank you for listening in my talk i hope you learned a lot from uh, this topic so if you want to reach me out so i'm also a mentor if you want uh, to be mentored so just reach me out at my website cgvillafranca.com and uh, you can also reach me in facebook and and I'm sometimes online in Facebook, so I'm sage.villafranca. And yeah, you are free to use all my codes in my github.com. So they are mostly updated uh, when it comes to tutorial. So outside IoT, if you want to learn more about development, so you are free to use that. And yeah, once again, thank you guys for listening to my talk. And Sheldon always says, Bazinga. All right. So thank you very much, Seiji, for the very informative and detailed presentation. Your invaluable knowledge is deeply, uh, deeply appreciated by our participants for today. So even though uh, Seiji wasn't able to uh, present in a live uh, broadcast, so I, I really hope na, uh, that very detailed presentation has helped or instilled knowledge to our participants today, especially for our students. And I hope that uh, what Seiji mentioned earlier uh, you would be able to get some ideas for your possible uh, capstone project in the near future. All right. So if you need more details, you can connect with Seiji after our session. So here I'll be flashing all of um, the links for or all of the details about how you can reach Seiji after this session. So 
here. So reach out to Seiji via WhatsApp, email, and website. He, uh, his website is sejivillafranca.com. So all of the things or all of the, pro- all of the projects that, have, that he has done is posted on his website. So I'll be flushing this for at least good 10 seconds or 5 seconds para mas screenshot nyo yung kanyang details. All right. Okay. Okay, so I, I, I assume everyone has already screen cap uh, the the links or the details on how to reach Seiji outline. So okay, so let's now uh, proceed to our second resource speaker or our sec- second session for today. Our second resource speaker is a CADS or CAD Sunrise Awardee as one of the top data scientists uh, in ASEAN, a 23-year-old data scientist working under GTM Analytics at Ring Central, where he handles various end-to-end uh, data science projects that helps Ring Central in their day-to-day business processes. He is also a part-time graduate student in his last year taking MS Computer Science or Masters in Computer Science in De La Salle University. His expertise is in the field of natural language processing, machine learning, data structures, and algorithms, and applying all of these things in the real-world scenarios. In his free time, he makes his own coffee and loves to play online games such as Apex uh, Apex Legends and various MMOs. Let's all give it up for data scientist from Ring Central, Justin Clemente. Good afternoon, Justin. Uh, Can you guys hear me? Uh, Yeah, I think your um, camera is off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. So, yeah. Um, hello, I'm Christian Justin Clemente. Uh, let me reintroduce myself now. So, I'm a data scientist at GTM Analytics. GTM means go to market. So, mostly marketing, sales, uh, customer transactional data yung hinahandle ko at Ring Central. So, what do I do at Ring Central? So, analytics means uh, it aids business decisions, it aids how businesses go in their day-to-day process. So through machine learning, through data science, I help uh, Ring Central uh, grow their business, uh, optimize their business uh, as much as possible. So I'm an MSCS student then at uh, the La Salle University of Manila. I'm taking my last year. Uh, in, I'm taking my thesis in machine translation in Philippine languages. So yeah, um, I think that's it. Uh, let me, before we start and uh, I want to gauge the audience first, since it's my first time speaking here at uh, Bulacan State University. Uh, my family lives near there, actually. Uh, my family lives in Paumbong, Bulacan. So, <laughs> I think, yeah, malapit since pag umuubi ako dyan, medyo nadadaanan ko yung pulso. So, yeah, uh, let me start with that audience demographic first. So, gusto ko lang malaman uh, ano yung course nyo. So, for me to know, uh, I want you to go to mendy.com. Uh, use the code 61190074 and type your answers right there. So, maybe, yes. I am. So, at least, as far as, kung din tingin ko kanina sa YouTube natin, may at least 800 uh, participants tayo. So, makikita natin kung lahat ba ng 800 na yun is nagpa-participate by uh, answering this uh, survey. Just want to know that on its demographic lang. Lisa, you'll give a few 30 seconds to one minute, I guess, uh, to let you guys answer it. Puro IT, ah. Yung may information systems. I think, and I think that's uh, based on the growth rate naman ng chart. Most of our audience are uh, taking information technology. Uh, konti lang yung ComSci and others. So we are have at least 771 watching sa YouTube channel. And 
ang sumasagot sa survey natin is around 200 plus. So yeah, I think I get the demographic already na. Uh, I'm gonna go back now to our uh, slides. So let me begin first. Uh, before I teach you guys what is machine learning, let me let us answer first the question or know how do humans learn. So I have three siblings here. Uh, my three, uh, three siblings, they are two boys and one girl. So nung bata sila, uh, I was, since I, ako yung panganay, I was involved in helping them yung nag-aalaga sa kanila. And throughout their growth, napapansin ko na nanonood sila ng YouTube and they were able to learn how to distribute these colors. Sa una, um, they don't know how. They just know that it's these three are different colors. These are red, blue, and yellow. Pero habang tumatanda sila, syempre, nalalaman nila, oh, this is red, this is yellow, this is blue. They were able to discriminate these different colors one another. So paano pa nila natututunan nyo? So according to science, meron tayo yung eyes natin sa retina. Pumapasok yung light coming from the sun or any source of light. Then we have the Roy G with the color spectrum. Pag nagbouch sa eyes natin, pumapasok siya sa eyes. Then uh, based on their wavelength, nung light wavelength na yun, nati-distinguish nila yung colors. So if the wavelength of light is at least 665 nanometers, uh, we will see red. If the wavelength of the light that bounces in our eyes is at least 400 nanometers, we see violet. So that's how we see the colors. So another task that nakikita ko sa kanila upon when they were growing is uh, fruits. So before I get to that, I want to summarize that humans are able to distinguish these different colors based on their wavelengths. So again, so coming uh, coming from the fruits, they were able to know or distinguish or to learn how these fruits are different, differentiated from one another. So there's this banana, the oranges, uh, the grapes, and the apple. So if may mga bata kayong kapatid, uh, we all know that mahilig sila sa fruits, sa mga matatabis, or even fruits, honestly. So how do we distinguish these fruits as humans? Tayo ba? So we have our color. We have our size, kung pani, and we have the weight, and etc. Like shapes and other stuff like that. So, kung round siya, pwede magbelong siya sa orange, sa apple, or sa grape. Then, based on their size, for sure, ang grapes mas maliliit compared sa oranges and apples. Then, if pahaba naman siya, of course, they belong to, the, to, uh, to banana. So, to summarize those two things that I was able to tell you earlier. So, based on wavelength, humans are able to distinguish between different colors. Based on this color, size, weight, and etc., like shapes, uh, they, we, humans are able to distinguish fruits. So, in a machine learning setting, I want you to wrap this up as features, X, and labels. So, we have our features, the color, size, and weight, and we want to classify that labels. So, I'll be interactive with you guys right now. Uh, Punta ulit kay sa menti.com. Ang task question ko naman ngayon is, our task right now is, let us distinguish these three animals, bird, cat, and dog. Ano yung mga features na pwede natin makita sa kanila that are able, that makes them distinguishable from one another? So I'll go to that slide right here. And if you guys go to menti.com, you guys use the same num the same code. Uh, there's a pop-up question out there. And then just answer the question, what features could be used to differentiate these animals? So it's more of a participative slide lang. So uh, one example dyan is uh, ears. One example feature is ears. And for birds, of course, we have uh, the feathers. And the banana. Yeah. Is this mag update no word cloud na dana? Ah. 
So, ayan. I think to summarize the top three features na nakikita ko dito is sound, size, and color. So, totoo naman yan. Depending on the size, mas maliit lagi ang birds compared sa cats and dogs. And so, sounds. Uh, that a dog barks, a cat meows. Something like that. And a, a bird greets. Yung nakita ko panina. So, ayan. Body structure, appearance, uh, and feathers, which is the most discriminative feature of birds, because ang dog and cat di naman uh, So going back to our slide, I think oh, I think at least now I guess I guess na yung concept between the features and the labels. Now, based from the things that I taught you earlier, how can we make machines learn? So almost the same lang then we have our features. Then we have an algorithm, then the algorithm grows from that labels. So it started first, ang history ng AI or machine learning started with the question, can machines think? So back in 1950, it's as early as 1950, Alan Turing, yung father ng computer science, he asked the questions that can machines think? Lahat ng technology pa nila pan digital, lahat analog. And then, yun nga, tinanong niya, can, mach can machines think? Can we make computers intelligent? So, he created the so-called imitation game that can know whether a machine is intelligent or not. I'm going to explain the technical side of it. But, uh, yeah, it started with him asking the question, can machines think? So, machine learning is only a subset of artificial intelligence. So, if you guys know the uh, K-drama startup, so, andyan si Nam Dosan, gumagawa siya ng mga AI applications, ng mga machine learning applications na that uses a camera or web, uh, web camera or something like that. So, machine learning started in the 1950s. Uh, it's only a subset of uh, mach, uh, mach artificial intelligence. Then, a few years, mga 2010, uh, pumasok yung deep learning. So that machine learning kasi more on ano lang siya, structured data, mga database, uh, CSV files, Excel files, yun yung pwede mong i-ano sa kanya, i-feed. Wala pa masyadong powerful algorithm that can learn with pictures, with text. But no 2010, uh, doon kasi nag-boom yung GPU, if you're familiar with GPU, then pumasok doon yung deep learning. Later, I'll explain what deep learning is. Pero yun yung pinaka-breakthrough with artificial intelligence. You were able to create self-driving cars, you were able to create yung mga news classifiers, yung mga, ano pa ba, open AI5, which I will explain later on. So yeah, but most of it, siguro yung laging nakikita computer vision, yung mga CCTV, nakaka-detect ng person, or kung nag -e sm kayo or Robinsons, yung camera nila doon na may temperature, tapos nade-detect yung temperature nyo, and yung naglalagay ng box dun pag nakakita ng tao, something like that. So, yun yung example ng deep learning. So, there are three types of machine learning. First is supervised learning. Second is unsupervised learning. Third is reinforcement learning. So, ang supervised learning, yung tinuro ko sa inyo kanina, uh, it is learning by example. So, requirement, a data set containing features, X, with their corresponding labels, Y. So, parang humans, uh, it learns by example. So, Yung mga kapatid ko naman, hindi naman sila basta-basta alam na kagat nila yung red, yellow, or blue, or yung mga fruits. At syempre, nagkakamari din sila sa una, but as they learn, by example, nitututo sila. Na prefer, hindi naman na perfect, but rather, they were able to master the concept of it. So, ang pinaka-challenge dito is need mo ng annotated data. So, if you want to create a an image classifier, like given an image, classify mo kung anong image yun, kailangan mo ng labels on that image. Ang unsupervised learning naman is learning by discovery. So, ang requirement niya, walang labels, kailangan nilang niya ng features. Ang pinaka-challenge dito is, it only arranges the data according to grouping. But it will need to rename these groups manually. So, more on, parang Lego block siya, tapos hahanapin mo yung mga magkakapares na Lego. Walang labels doon, parang grouping lang siya. And then, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is learning by experiment experimentation. So, nandito yung feedback. Positive feedback, negative feedback, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. It means a, an environment to be simulated and the challenges, mas matagal mag-train yung model. Later, I will uh, define what training is. So, uh, example na nasa right side is supervised learning. So, we have the red and the green dots here. 
So this algorithm is able to learn the boundary between the red and the green dots. So annotated yung data na yan kasi kita nyo naman, may green and red na colors. So naghahanap siya ng decision boundary, like what makes these features uh, discriminate, that they discriminate between each other, different from one another. What makes the green dot and the red dot different from each other. So gumagamit tayo ng machine learning algorithm for that. Ang learning by discovery naman is based on this clump of points. Ginugroup niya lang. So da, puro blue yan lahat sa una, pero without the labels, nagahanap lang siya ng groupings. Then by these groups, kinukulayan lang niya. And learning by experimentation, mostly sa games to na-apply. AI or uh, games, yung mga nakikip, yung kung naglalaro kayo ng online games, yung mga AI doon, like yung AI kay Dota, AI kay Valorant, AI sa CSGO, most of that are trained using reinforcement learning. Or data yung Flappy Bird na AI or something like that. So mostly reinforcement learning yan kasi may environment ka. May rules ka that abide by that environment. So in this talk, I'll focus lang kay uh, supervised learning. But before that, uh, ano ba yung applications ng machine learning sa three types of machine learning na sinabi ko kanina? So, sa supervised learning, uh, self-driving cars, so kay Tesla, sikat na sikat si Tesla ngayon, they were able to create a deep learning algorithm that uh, it, that is able to uh, drive uh, that drive cars in the United States and other countries. So, na-deploy na siya. It is working right now. Di ba nga natutulog habang nag-self-drive yung Tesla? So, gamit nila doon, for sure, supervised learning. Since may camera, may mga data sila, and mostly ng mga data na yun, annotated for sure. So it took them at least more, more than a decade to do it. So a supervised learning kay uh, Google News. So may familiar kayo pag nagsearch kayo kay Google or pag pumunta kayo sa kahit anong news sites, laging nakagroup by topic ang, ang mga news natin. So before that, nung walang label dati yun. Like before, ang raw data, meron yung kayang news articles. Then, may unsupervised learning, may un algorithm na pumapas mo dyan that groups them together. And then, we have OpenAI5, reinforcement learning. Hindi ko alam po sino nagdodota to dito. Hindi ako masyado madalaro ng dota to. But I'm familiar with it. So, OpenAI5 is an AI algorithm that can play dota to. Lahat sila lima. So, one of the main challenges of AI is letting those AI work together. But back, back last 2019, nagkaroon ng breakthrough in this field. So, yung OpenAI5, nagtalo nila yung uh, TI champions, si OG. If eh, familiar ko kay OG, back in 2019, natalo siya ng AI. So, yung company called DeepMind was acquired by Google Ata, I think. Since, ayun nga, medyo groundbreaking to. Kasi it does not only beat humans, but it was able to cooperate with one another. So Dota is a 5v5, so at least there are 5 AI there cooperating with each other. So gamit nila doon, reinforcement learning, mala, uh, it's a very complex algorithm since it's a very customized one. But it runs on the principles of reinforcement learning. So gumawa sila ng environment, uh, yung Dota 2 game engine, open naman siya. Uh, yun yung environment nila. Then nilagyan nila ng ano, gumawa sila algorithm, madaming, madaming research na nangyari. Uh, it took them at least five years. Nagsimula yung research around 2014, 2015. Uh, nagkaroon ang nang around 2019. So a typical machine learning workflow uh, is this. So yung kaseji kanina, um, it's more on the IoT side. So yung data acquisition, how it acquires data from using dev smart devices. Diba? So it can be combined with machine learning to have uh, predictions, to have data-driven decisions. So once you have acquired the data, meron tayong tinatawag na model development and training. And then we evaluate that model based on its accuracy. So if gagawa ka ng, if, ng image classifier na model, ang gusto mo lagi at least 100% accurate siya na lahat ng image na binibigay mo sa kanya tama, correct? But in real world, it's impossible 100%, around 80% or to 90% lang lahat. It's impossible mag 100%. So, ayan, after mo ma-fine tune yung model, after it is somewhat perfect in a sense, uh, you deploy it and magkakaroon ka ng prediction. 
and then monitoring, alerting, something like that. So, pag data drift, meaning lang ng data drift is as tumatagal yung model, nagbabago yung data natin. In my work, uh, puro transactional customer data ko. So, ang transactions, nagbabago yan every day, every month, every quarter. So, hindi lang basta-basta na may model ka na yun na yun. At some point, the model needs to be somewhat retrained, tawag namin doon na ina-update namin siya yung new, with new data, with new knowledge. So, supervised learning, uh, since magpo-focus tayo doon, sabi ko nga, may f of x, then may y tayo. The f of x, the x are the features, and the y are the labels. So, we have here the features, the x. We have here the machine learning algorithm, yung f. And then, these are our labels, ground. Truth. So, yung F is just a machine learning function. It's a machine learning algorithm. Magiging mathematical tayo dito kasi to be honest with you guys, machine learning is a mathematically heavy field. Data science is mathematically heavy field. You don't, hindi mo kailangan naman talita ko sa math, but rather you just need to know the basics of it since it's not advanced math naman talaga. So, we have here F of, and then we want to cap the machine learning algorithm to capture the pattern or the features para makapag-label siya ng Y. So, in a one-sentence scenario, ang supervised learning is given features X, we want to find a function that maps these features to their respective labels. So, starting with our data. So, sabihin mo meron kang Excel file, meron kang X na features and Y as the label. Ayan. Gagawin natin dyan, ihiwalay natin sila sa dalawang sets. We have our train set, we have our test set, and observe data. Itong training set, ito yung gagamitin natin to run the machine learning model. So for example, if meron kang 100 rows of data na gusto mong i i ilagay sa machine learning algorithm, hindi lahat ng 100 rows na yon ilalagay mo sa machine learning algorithm. I-divide mo siya dapat. Um, Rule of thumb ko dyan is 70-30. 70% is training data. 30% is test data. So, if you feed ko yung 70% ng data na yun sa machine learning algorithm, iti-train natin siya. Then, ang output natin is a trained model. Then, papasok naman natin yung testing set doon. So, dapat hindi makikita nung, nung machine learning upon training yung testing set. Makikita lang niya dapat pag itetest na natin. So, after that, pag pinasok natin yung test, test set sa machine learning model na na-train na natin, tapos na i-train, hindi ongoing, doon na papasok yung predictions. So, yung predictions ng label, i-compare natin sa true labels nila, which is y test. Then, from that, uh, makikita natin yung predictions with a true value, and then we have at least an accuracy there. So, for example, if 30% is our training test set, uh, may 30 images tayo, kunyari, uh, 20 out of 30 yung correctly na-classify ng machine learning model, 20 over 30 is at least, ilang percent yun? It at least 66%, then it's 66% accurate. If it's uh, 25 out of 30, 25 correctly classified, may limang mali na hindi mali na-classify ng model, it is at least 83% accurate. So, ito, one of the um, machine learning algorithms na introduce ko lang sa inyo. Since na kuha na natin yung concept between three uh, machine learning process, uh, pas, uh, ito yung example ng concept of machine learning algorithm. It classifies based on similarity and k-nearest neighbor. If k is equal to 1, classifies based on the closest data point. So, dito, papasok, familiar kayo kay Euclidean distance, I think lahat naman ata tayo medyo familiar doon since uh, nakita pansin mo naman most of you guys are IT. So, I think we have some basic algebra classes naman dyan. So, hindi kailangan i-train si k nearest neighbors kasi ang ginagawa lang niya, pinaplot lang niya, so you can see here on the right side, pinaplot lang na lahat ng data points. So, we have the green dot here and the red dot. The red one are the red labels, the green are the green labels. So, the white is the new data. So, makapansin niyo yung k dito nag -e increase So, hanapin niya lang yung nearest neighbor. So, for example, what? Si white, 
uh, pag k is equal to 1, ikaklasify niya based on the ng closest data point. So here, ang closest data point kay white is green. So green yung, class, yung prediction ni white, yung class ni white, yung label ni white. Ngayon, if k is equal to 2 naman, ang pinakamalapit sa kanya is green pa rin, dalawang green. So ang classification ni white is green pa rin. Ngayon, if 3 naman, nakikita niya dito, sabihin natin 5 na lang siguro. As you can see here in the uh, GIF or the GIF, pagdating sa 5, red na yung classification niya. Kasi tatlo na yung 3 out of 5 data points, 3 out of 5K are called, are red, yung pinakamalapit sa kanya. So, ito yung formula for the Minkowski distance or sabihin natin the Euclidean distance. So, it works on a, nakita nyo, X and Y dito. But in our case, sa machine learning, but pag marami tayong feature, sabi mo 100 dimensions yan. So, ito, medyo simplified version lang siya kasi it's in two dimensions. We have at least two features here, X and Y. So, we have here, the second algorithm is ang support vector machine. So, we want to find the hyperplane that best separates the two classes of data. So, yung pinakita kong video kanina, uh, we want to create a plot or a Euclidean space na kaya mag-separate ng green and red dots. So, si support vector machine, makikita nyo, hinanap niya hyperplane. Ang hyperplane is dalawa yan. Uh, yung white, yung black, black na line and the dotted blue one. So, dalawa yung hyperplane. So, I want to explain it further. Pero ang pinakagulang niya is you find a decision boundary. Tapos, ang mangyari lang yan, if we have a new data, may hyperplane. So, for example, if ang new data natin is around here, nandito siya sa green na hyperplane. If our new data is around here, nandun siya sa red na hyperplane. Pag dito, mangyayari siya, kanyari, nandito siya sa gitna, dito, parang may, some, may mangyayari rotation na lang dyan. Parang cleaners na ipor. Siguro, to oversimplify things. Pero, there's a mathematical formula there na hindi ko na masyadong i-deep dive. Pero lahat lang yan, uh, nasa hyperplane kami. So, may tinatawag kay support vector machine na kernel trick. Uh, tinatransform niya yung data into a higher dimensional space if a hyperplane can't be found. For example, two-dimensional yung data natin na nasa right, mahirap magharap ng hyperplane dyan. Kasi if we found, hindi ka makakahanap ng hyperplane dyan, kahit if you're a human, kahit ako, hindi ko mahanap. So, ang ginagawa ni kernel trick, from two-dimensional, i-upgrade niya yung data into a three-dimensional space. So, as you can see here in the left, na-upgrade niya. So, ano nangyari? Nakagawa siya ng hyperplane kasi na-transform siya into a 3D dimension. So, ganun lang siya. Uh, Iniba niya yung dimension. Parang si Thanos yan. Reality can be whatever I want. <laughs> Something like that. So, to summarize, uh, medyo mathematical ang machine learning. Pero lahat yan, since nakikita nyo, may Euclidean space tayo, may X and Y, napaplot natin sila lahat. Everything can be represented in a matrix. So, lagi ko yan sinasabi sa mga nagmamentor dito sa mga uh, college students na nagpapisis. Always think of features as a matrix. Lagi. So, in a supervised machine learning, in supervised machine learning algorithms, ang pinaka-goal natin is to minimize the error between the predicted values and the true values. So, ito, paano natin tinitrain yung machine learning algorithm. So, sa una, hindi pa ganun kaganda yung machine learning algorithm natin. So, Using convex optimization, ito yung formula niya sa SVM. Iba-iba yung formula per machine learning algorithm. Pero it's in the, it runs on the same principle, which is convex optimization. We want to minimize the error kasi error nga eh. Ayaw natin pataas yung error. Gusto natin liitan yung error. So we want this to be as low as possible. So ito yung tinatawag at some point gradient descent. So, ang next algorithm, I think it's the last algorithm. Ito yung very sikat na algorithm ngayon, neural networks. It is inspired by human, how human brains work. Um, it's very powerful, pero it needs computational resources. So, lately lang, sabi ko kanina, lately lang siya sumikat. Kasi, most of the time, if you use neural, net neural networks, kailangan mo ng GPU to do that. So, we have here the neuron, 
in the brain and we have here a single neuron sa neural network which is called a perceptron. So usually may input ka, the input are the features, may papasok siya dito sa perceptron, then may output siya na label. So ito yung, pag dinamihan mo yung neurons, ganito yung itsura niya. We have here the input layer, which are your features. Hidden layer are defined by you, or kung sino man gumagawa ng algorithm, ang output niya, yung label. So ito yung mga mathematical theories involved, uh, mostly linear algebra to. Kaya kung sinabi yung matrix kanina, kasi lahat in neural networks, all are, all, everything is represented in a matrix format. So ito yung itawag mag multilayer perceptron or neural network. So ito yung mga ginagamit ni Tesla you know, for their self-driving cars. However, mas complex lang na neural networks yun. Pero it runs in the same principle. We have the activation function here. Mag-activate lang, mag-fire ang neurons if it's uh, tama yung label or not. And then we have the last function here. Ito yung convex optimization. So we want to minimize the error. So makita nyo may Y. Y is our test set, is the true label. And then we have here the activation function, which is your prediction model. So how do we train this? So nakita niya kanina yung arrow papunta dito. So once we train the neural network, may mga weights siya. So ang input papasok dyan, magmultiply yung weights, mag activate siya. Pero paano natin nakukuha yung weights? So dito na papasok yung back propagation. Dito na yung training part. So Nakikita nyo dito, meron siyang calculus involved. Hindi ko na siya tutu... I won't teach it here na since it's a very complex uh, mathematical formula. Pero ayun, gumagamit lang siya ng backpropagation to train. So, paulit-ulit lang siya. It runs forward to go get a prediction. If mali yung prediction, it runs backward to correct the weights. So, parang may correction lang na nangyayari. So, parang sa atin as humans, if nagkamali tayo sa isang bagay, kinokorect natin yun para hindi na maulit yung next mistake. So, ganun lang siya. In an oversimplified manner. So, may mga update formula lang siya. Update, weight updates. Tinatawag natin na weight updates. Parameter updates. Stuff like that. So, I know, medyo confusing siya right now kasi one hour lang yung talk. I, you can even learn your metrics in one hour. It took me at least a year to, mass, to grasp the concept of it. So, in a GIF format, ganito lang itsura niya. It goes forward, it goes backward until it reach a satisfiable accuracy. So, model complexity, how do we know? When do we stop training? So, there's a theory kasi in machine learning na as your model gets complex, nag-overfit siya. Ang meaning ng overfitting is the algorithm is too complex that it has the high error on test data. Remember, ang pinaka-goal natin kanina is we want to minimize the error both on the test data and the training data. Ngayon, malalaman mo na overfit siya if ang baba ng error mo sa training data pero ang taas ng error mo sa test data. Kasi ka, nag-overfit na siya. Ang test data mo ang pinakabasihan mo kung accurate enough ba yung model. If mababa siya sa training pero sobrang laki ng error sa testing, overfit siya. Kasi at some point, ang ginagawa na lang ng model is memorize na lang niya yung data mo. Hindi, na siya, hindi niya na kaya mag-generalize. Ang goal ng machine learning is to generalize on data. So, kaya may tinatawag kaming ideal range for model complexity is dapat mas halos same or mas malap, malap, malapit lagi ang error ng training data and test data natin. If mataas naman yung error both or sobrang baba naman sila parehas, underfitting, it means that uh, it can do more. It can generate a higher performance model of underfitting. Pag overfit naman, it's too complex. Sobrang overkill na na tinatawag natin. So, sabi nga ni Andrew na one of the pioneers in AI education, don't worry about it if you don't understand. Kasi right now, it's a one-hour talk. I know, it's a lot to absorb. So, code demo muna tayo. So, one of the best practices of machine learning is marketing. So, ang uh, field ko ngayon, name central, I'm, go, go, I'm handling marketing data. So, we have here a sample data set. Bank marketing data set. CSV file lang siya with at least 21 columns. So ito yun, we have 20 features, age, job, marital, education, 
So, kung ano age ng customer, per row, it's considered as one customer. Uh, contact plus, con- plus, con- plus contact communication type. And cellular or telephone, telephone month, kung anong month siya last contacted. Day of week, campaign. So, mga features yan. So, meron tayong customer data, row column 1 to 11. Ang attributes natin is column, uh, other attributes is column 12 to 15 which is yung campaign, three days, previous, the outcome. And then we also have the social and economic variables here, which is 16 to 20. Ang goal ng data set here is sa last column, ito yung label niya. Yes or no lang siya. Has the client subscribed to a term deposit? In business terms, tinatawag namin ito na customer conversion. Ang mini ng customer conversion this may business ako, gusto ko ma-convert yung customer na yan. Gusto ko maging client ko siya. Gusto siya ang pag-subscribe uh, sa akin. In the bank setting, magiging customer ka ng bank pag nag-open ka ng account. So, ang goal ng data set na ito is given the customer data, given the campaign data, kung tinatawagan ba nila or not, and given the social and economic variables, gusto natin malaman if kaya ba natin ma-convert yung customer na yun na makapag-open ng bank account sa atin. So, lahat ng banks ginagawa tong uh, bank marketing data set na to. So, ito yung sample code niya. Python ang gamit ko lagi since uh, medyo data science friendly si Python. So, ayan, makita nyo. For example, day of week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, since wala namang Saturday, Sunday sa banks. Job niya, Admin, at least 10k rows ang admin job, administrative jobs. 9k rows ang blue-collar jobs. Education, most of the customers na nandito sa dataset are graduate ng university degree. Most of, parang second naman is high school graduate lang. Yung isa, basic elementary lang. Iba, professional course. So, Ayun, I think yun yung mga sample features natin. So, given those features per customer, gusto natin malaman if if magko-convert ba, if magko-open ba ng bank account yung customer natin. So, ayan siya. So, ito, dito ko in-split yung training into testing. Ayan, oh, predictor ko nung yes or no lang. Kung yes, nag-convert siya, na, nag-open yung, na, yung customer ng bank account sa atin. If no, hindi siya nag-open ng bank account. So, syempre, hindi kaya marin ni machine learning ang yes or no, we convert it into a binary, 1 or 0. 1 if nag-convert, yes. Uh, 0 if not, hindi siya nag-convert. So, paano ginagamit ni bank marketing ng mga banks to? Pag na-train na nila yung model, sabi natin 80%, 90% accurate nila. Pag may pumasok sa bank account, pag pumasok kayo sa isang bank o tapos gusto mo mag-open, tapos itatype, mag-fill up ka ng form, itatype nila yung customer information mo. Yung customer information na pinasok mo sa, kan- sa computer nila, papasok dito sa model na to. Tapos mag-generate ng uh, percentage kung kaya mo ba mag-open ng bank account or not. It is same with the credit card. Kung bibigyan, uh, if may nag-apply na sa inyo ng credit card, or kasi naman may knowledge sa credit card dito, bago ko mag-apply ng credit card, titignan ng bank ko yung salary mo, yung customer, in- yung information mo, saan ka nakatira, ilan yung, ilan yung anak mo, ilan, yung, ilan kayo sa pamilya. So based doon, papasok sa algorithm kung, bib- kung dapat ka ba nila bigyan ng credit card or hindi. So that's how data science process works in a banking scenario. So, ayan. So, mako-convert na natin. Madami tayong gagawing transformation dito. Iko-convert natin siya into a matrix. Hindi ko na-explain kung paano natin siya kinonvert. And then, nagte-train tayo. For example, ang pinaka-ano dito, random forest. Or siguro support vector machines na lang. So, support vector machines, may library naman. Hindi nyo kailangan i-code lahat ng formula na sinabi ko kanina sa inyo. Meron tayong library na ito may na may gumawa na may gumawa na may nagcode na ng formula para sa atin. Ang gagawin na lang natin, ipapasok na lang natin yung data set doon sa algorithm. So, ayun, nakikita nyo, marital divorce, marital uh, loan, job, ito yung mga social economic indicators. Then of course, ayun nga separate yung training and testing. 
and then standard scalar it's more of a mathematical ano lang that ito yung linear uh, support vector classifier then ito try niya lang pa ulit-ulit so napansin niyo 965 so meaning may 960 times na try niya yung algorithm tapos kukunin niya yung pinakamagandang performance doon so according dito sa accuracy natin f1 score is the accuracy our model is at least 84% accurate to classify bank conversions kung mag-convert ba ang customer. Ngayon, uh, ito yung plot niya. Medyo mahirap na interpret to if you're not knowledgeable in data science. Pero ayan, nakita niyo, test F1 score. F1 score is just accuracy in data science terms. So, 84% accurate siya. So, kikita niyo yung confusion matrix dito, yung true label. Ito sa test set to ah. True label 1 and 0. So sa true label, nakita natin, sa hindi nag-convert, na-classify niya 20, 22,606 correctly out of 6,000, may mali siya na 6,268. So out of at least 28,000 na hindi nag-convert, may 6,000 siya na na-classify niya na mag-convert. Ngayon, dito naman sa 1, sa true label, 944 yung na-classify niya correctly, na, na correctly classified as predicted, 1 and 1. Pero may 448 na hindi niya na-classify incorrectly. So, kaya nakikita natin, mataas naman kasi if makikita niyo, 0, 0, 1, 1. Mataas naman ang uh, accuracy natin. Then, papasok dito, uh, if you work in a back scenario, tatanungin ang business ng mga boss mo yan, Paano mo na sabi ni 84% correct siya? May tinatawag kami sa data science na model interpretability. So, ang model interpretability, hindi lang kasi basta-basta magte-train ka ng machine learning model, as ah, 84% accurate, sige na, go, uh, deploy nyo na yan, gamitin nyo na yan sa mga customers natin, hindi. Dapat, yung machine learning model, nagko-coincide siya, nag intersect siya sa business side. So, there's the technical side, ng machine learning, may business side na dapat nag adhere siya. So, siguro, uh, ganit. So, ang, ginawa, ang ginawa ko here is clean up ko lahat ng features. Tapos, kinuha natin yung mga most important features. So, according dito sa atin, hanap, hanapin ko lang SBM. So, according to support vector machine, ang pinaka-important feature is employee var rate Second important feature is cost price and durable TM. So mostly social economic variables to. Balik tayo dito sa data set information natin. Ano meaning nung tatlong yun? F bar rate, cost price, and durable TM. F bar rate is employment variation rate. Kung mataas ang employment rate sa quarter na yun, mas maraming mag-open ng bank account. Which is totoo naman. Kasi with employment comes salary. Pag maraming kumikitang tao, maraming nag-open ng bank account. Cons price IDX, consumer price index. Consumer price index, I think, is related to the stock market in a European setting. So meaning kung mura ang pilihin or hindi ganun kalaki ang, ang inflation rate, maraming nag-open ng bank account. Which is totoo, kasi pag bababa ang inflation rate, hindi masyadong nagmamahal ang bilhin. Mas maraming natitipid ang tao. Mas marami kang natatagong pera. Mas mag mas pwede kang mag-open ng bank account. Ay, ano, pa ba, ano pa ba yung sunod? Cellular, contact cellular, and contact cellphone. Ano meaning nito dun sa data set natin? So, contact communication type, cellular. Meaning, pag kinawagan mo yung customer gamit ang cellphone nila, rather than telephone, tapos sinagot nila yun, mas likely sila na mag-open ng bank account sa bank mo. Ano isa? Telephone. Ayan, cellular telephone. And then, ito, NR employed. Ang meaning ng NR employed is number of employees. Again, related siya kay employment variation rate. Na if mataas ang employment rate ng bansa, ng country, edi, mas maraming pwedeng mag-open ng bank account. And then, doon do naman tayo sa customer information, blue-collar jobs. So, ang blue-collar jobs, sabi, uh, based on machine learning model natin to, uh, ini-interpret ko lang yung output ng machine learning model natin. Pag blue-collar job yung customer mo, dapat 
mas likely siya na mag-open ng bank account. So, if based on this, ganito yung mga use cases niya sa banko. So, pwede din siya ma-apply sa ibang, sa pagkukuha ng kotse, sa mga bahay, something like that. Yung mga, kung mag avail ka ng housing loan, mga car loan, something like that. Ganun yung gamit niya sa marketing. Yung mga, dun, din, dito din papasok yung targeted ads. So, if familiar, familiar kayo sa Facebook, yung mga ads niya, is naging related sa inyo. So, mostly AI din yun kasi nakikita niya yung pattern kung ano yung mga nalalike mo, yung mga sinasubscribe mo, kung ano yung mga binabasa mo sa Disney. So, ganun lang siya. So, I think uh, I'll give a few minutes. I have a few minutes na lang. So, yung pinakita ko sa inyo kanina is just basic machine learning. May tinatawag tayong deep learning yung mga neural networks na. So, kanina kasi, uh, in, may feature extractor ako na algorithm for to extract the features and then we have the traditional ML algorithm. Pag deep learning kasi, raw, kahit yung raw data na. So, with the device of deep learning, pwede ka na magpasok ng unstructured data. So, kanina, puro Excel file lang yung pinakita ko sa inyo. Galing Excel file yun, CSV file, kama sa curated file. Dito kay deep learning, pwede ka na magpasok ng images. Pwede ka na magpasok ng text. So, ito yung, uh, in this case, puro images ang pumapasok. So, with deep learning comes large data. Kaya ka deep learning siya kasi kailangan niya ng malaking-malaking data. So, si ImageNet, back in 2015, doon nag-start, uh, gumawa sila ng publicly available data set composing of 1.4 million images na may 1,000 classes. So, ayan, yung mga nakaklassify nila yung parang may label na annotated na to. So, pwede ka mag-supervise learning dito. So, mostly, ang gamit dito is convolutional neural networks. So, paano ba gumagana to? Ganyan siya. So, any image, if familiar ka with image processing, yung mga JPEG files, yung mga PNG files nyo, pwede nyo siya i-convert into an RGB format. Lahat ng image na yan, RGB matrix lang. So, may red matrix, may green matrix, and may blue matrix. Ngayon, yung, yun na yung input mo dun sa neural network mo. Tapos siya na lang maghahanap ng pattern, siya na maghahanap ng features with that. Gamit yung convolutional neural network. Hindi mo na kailangan ng editing. You can feed the convolutional neural, neural networks raw image data. So ito, may mga functions sa Python, sa Java, na i-convert niya yung image into a uh, RGB matrix. Para lahat naman ng image yan, how ganyan nagbabasa si computer. Lahat ng JPEG files, lahat ng image files sa computer, lahat yan may RGB matrix. O kung hindi man RGB, si MYK. So, ganun lang siya. So, based on the ImageNet data, the ImageNet challenge, sobrang dami ng layers. So, nakikita nyo, yung isang linya na yan, one layer lang yan. So, based kay ImageNet, ang pinakamagandang performance is 152 layers. Kaya siya tinatawang na deep. Kasi just imagine, if 152 na ganyan, sunod-sunod. Kaya siya tinatawag na deep learning. Ngayon, beyond image classification, ito may tinatawag na object detection. Rather than classifying image, one image, classify mo, cat, dog, person, object, ganyan. Dito, kaya niya na ma-localize, maglagay ng bounding box kung ano yung mga taong meron, kung ano yung mga meron sa image. So, ang tawag dito is YOLO na model. So, convolution, convolutional neural networks lang siya na may counting tweaks. So, ayan, nakakapaglagay na siya ng bounding box. So, that's what AI and machine learning is. So, yung deep learning, actually, yung neural networks, 1990s pa siya na-propose. Bakit mo yun lang? Kasi ngayon lang nag-start yung frameworks and tools. Dati, na kung nakikita yung mga, yung kanina, yung nakikita yung mathematical formula, you need to code it by code. Kung dati, 1990, ang programming language lang nun, C, assembly. Sige mo magkakode ka mathematical formula gamit C. So we have TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, and PyTorch. Ito, mga Python libraries to that you can code machine learning algorithms with. Aside from that, computational power. So with great power comes empty wallets. Correct. So ngayon, yung may GPUs, uh, 
with the rise of GPUs, mas malakas yung computational power niya. Napansin naman natin, if you play games, pag mas maganda yung game, mas maganda yung graphics ng game na ginagamit mo, mas kailangan mo na mas maganda yung GPU. So same din with deep learning. Pag mas malaki yung neural network mo, mas deep learning siya, mas malaking, mas maraming layer, mas matagal siya i-train kasi mas malaking computational power yung kailangan mong gawin. So mostly, um, sa mga companies, nag-run sila ng GPU sa cloud. Google Cloud, Amazon, Microsoft Azure. So lahat yan, nag rent ng GPUs. Kasi bumili ka ng uh, on-prem GPUs. Ito for games lang naman to. Um, additional fact, yung nakikita ng GPU right now is just for gaming GPUs. Pag sa deep learning, may mas magalalaki pang GPU mismo. As in GPU na pang AI talaga. Parang si NVIDIA gumawa siya ng AI ng GPU na talagang for AI. Tinatawag nila yung TPU, Tensor Processing Unit. Hindi na siya GPU na Graphical Processing Unit, doon Tensor Processing Unit. So, ito si OpenAI 5, yung Dota 2 AI kanina. So, tingnan nyo, man, tingnan nyo yung um, CPU niya. 128,000 CPU cores on Google Cloud Platform. Yung GPU na ginamit niya is 256 P100 GPU. Test na P100 to. Sabi mo kung ngayon may RTX 3060 ka, mas powerful to P100. Tapos 256 na ganun. Experience collected kung gaano kalami yung data. And then, may 1 million observation siya. Batches per minute, 60. So kung may batch size siya na 1, 1 million observation, labas kay calculator dito. Per minute, 260 batches. So, 148, 576, times 60, I divided by 60 siya. That's at least 17,476 uh, minutes. So, divide natin by hours. 291 hours. Divide natin by 24. So, itong OpenAI 5, it took 12 days or at least 2 weeks to train the model. So, ganyan siya kalaki, ganyan siya katagal. Partida, sobrang laki na ng resource nila. So, what is mas, kung hindi ma-afford to, isipin mo na lang gano'ng katagal, ba? So, kaya nga sabi ko, it's at least five years long yung research na to. Kasi before they make a leap in that research, ang dami nilang experimentation. So, ito, isang experiment pa lang siya. Madami kang gustong experiment if you're you, uh, creating an AI algorithm. So, two weeks, one experiment, isipin na lang gano'n ka. Gano'n ka tagal yung research na yun, right? And then, we have here cloud computing. So, ngayon, kung wala kang GPU, kung hindi kaya ng laptop mo na mag, uh, mag-power up ng GPU or AI, si Cloud, si Google Cloud Platform, AWS, or Microsoft, uh, pwede sila, mayroon silang rent a GPU. So, of course, may bayad, pero pwede, mo, pwede ka na mag-set up ng environment mo, ng coding environment mo sa cloud. So, may website ka na lang na-access, yung credentials mo, ilalagay mo na lang something like that. And then again, yung data, nakita niyo yung data na personal set ko kanina. So, because of this guy, mas madali tayo mag-share ng data. Sino to? If, if anyone's familiar with this, this is Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the World Wide Web. So, kung 1990s, wala pa siguro ang internet nun. Sipin mo, kung may data ako, tapos gusto ko paggamit sa ibang researcher, ibang gumagawa ng AI algorithm, paano ko ipapadala yung AI, yung data ko? Lalagay ko pa siya sa hard drive, isi-ship ko pa siya, something like that. Pero dahil ngayon, we're at the digital age na, mas madali na mag-share ng data. Kasi may World Wide Web, may internet na, sasend ko lang yung file sa'yo, tapos na-share ko na yung data sa'yo. Pero beforehand, mahirap nga mag-share ng data, kaya hindi masyadong sikat yung AI dati. Kasi even though yung mga concepts ng support vector machines, kinilas ni Ibors, neural networks was in the 90s pa. Even 80s, honestly. Wala tayong way to experiment it kasi lahat naka-digital pa. And kung if you live in the 80s to 90s, if familiar ka sa floppy disk, ilan lang yung size ng 3 kilobytes. And if you have millions of rows, millions of images, hindi ka siya dun sa floppy disk, yung data mo. So, lalagay mo siya sa hard drive, mo siya. So, at least right now, we have cloud, we have everything. We have the tools. So, despite these advances, uh, there are still plenty of things that needs to be done. So, ito, ano pa ba yung challenges in machine learning? Di ba sobrang advanced na? Meron na tayong self-driving cars. Ang ganda ni Google. 
ang galing na ng OpenAI 5, madami pa rin challenges. First one is adversarial attacks. Even though gumawa ka ng AI algorithm na kaya mag-classify ng image, prone pa rin siya to adversarial attacks. Ano meaning ng adversarial? If you know how neural networks work, alam mo yung weaknesses niya. So for example, alam mo na kung paano siya dayain yung prediction. So for example, if ilalagay mo yung neural, magde-deploy ka ng image classification or kanyara sa security, sa bank security, maglalagay ka ng CCTV doon, tapos lalagay mo ng AI para maka-detect if may tao or wala kung may naglalakaw or not. Madali lang dayain yun kasi prone ang AI sa adversarial attacks. And then algorithmic bias. Ito, medyo sikat na sa US. Um, since AI learns on data, and data is bias, nalalearn din ni machine learning model ang bias. So for example, um, sa US, parang may isang AI experiment doon na gumawa sila ng AI algorithm na kaya mag-classify ng risk ng person kung ang person ba ay dangerous or not from 1 to 10. So 10 being the most dangerous classif classification and 1 being the lowest classification. So magpakita ka lang ng picture ng tao, pasok mo yung, custom, yung information ng tao, ng ng kwestong information ng tao doon. Ano yung mga prior offenses niya? Kaya niya mag-classify kung high risk or low risk yung person. So napansin nila doon, based sa AI algorithm, since yung data ka, galing sa data ng US, may bias involved doon sa data kasi very systematic ang racism sa US. Nalar ng AI algorithm yung bias against black people. So mapapansin nyo here, si Brisha Broden, uh, classified siya as high risk. Pero juvenile misdemeanors lang ang offenses niya. Compared dito kay Vernon Prater na may two armed robberies, one armed attendant robbery, and one grand theft. And something like that. So, to summarize na na-understand kung ano yung pinasok natin na data kay AI, kung bias yun, kaya niyang malearn ang bias. So, dun yung tinatawag natin na algorithmic, algorithmic bias. So, as much as possible, us, as ako, data science ako, us, ah, uh, Dapat pinaprevent ko siya kasi it's on, in the, on the ethical side naman sa part ng trabaho ko. Na, for example, if you work in banks, I don't work in banks, pero yung best friend ko kasi data scientist naman sa bank, medyo important sa kanila na dapat hindi, hindi ka maglalagay ng information sa AI na kaya makakuha ng bias. And then, using common sense is still hard. So for example, familiar kay Google Translate, hindi niya kaya maglagay ng common sense. Kung ano lang yung base dun sa syntax, base lang sa sentence na pinasok mo, yun pa rin yan. So paper jam, nakikita natin sa printers yun. Pero pag pinasip mo in Spanish, it's mermelada de papel. So paper jam, na jam talaga, yung parang strawberry jam. Yun yung meaning ng mermelada. Eh. So, pero sa atin, in English or in Tagalog, ang paper jam, may na jam na paper sa printer. Diba? And then, again, lack of data. So, ako, thesis ko, machine translation on Philippine languages. So, mga Kapampangan, Cebuano, Chapacano, doon, sobrang konti ng data natin doon compared sa English, a French, Portuguese. So, kung ang wala, kung wala tayong data on that, hindi kaya gawin ng AI. Since AI or deep machine learning relies on data. So, lagi mong tatanungin, before you create a machine learning capstone project, do you have data on this? Kasi yun yung naging problem ko sa thesis ko nung undergrad ako. I was creating an American Sign Language Interpreter. So parang gumawa ko ng neural network na ang input mo is video, then kaya niya classify yung, Amer yung sign language niya doon. So medyo sikat na use case yun. Pero yun, Filipino Sign Language kasi. Filipino Sign Language. Basta walang data available. So what we did was, nag-consult ako sa isang sign language expert or uh, advocate ng deaf people na marunong mag-sign language. Binidyohan namin siya. Gumawa kami ng data, ng sarili namin data, which is sobrang effort na ma-arget. And then, related resources, tapat uh, tayo, towards accessible AI education. Um, with this, ngayon, sobrang accessible na ang AI and machine learning. If you guys have the kapa, alam ko ngayon medyo nose deep, pero we have Coursera, we have Stanford University, we have Deep Learning AI. Google nilang lang to, i-YouTube ni lang to. Ang Stanford, libre ang lectures nila on AI sa YouTube. So, and this, this is Andrew now. It's one of the pioneers ng AI education. And 
then learning resources uh, since heavy math siya at yung mga pwede yung uh, math resources for for uh, AI or machine learning and then yeah Stanford machine learning Stanford ako very fan ako ng Stanford kasi lahat ng lectures nila online na sa YouTube so as long as you have the drive you have the interest for it it's fine and then we have deep learning nakita niya puro Stanford yan then we have also TensorFlow and then if you guys want to join some of our AI and data science organizations sa Facebook ito siya search niya ng data science Manila AI Pilipinas and then if you guys want to follow me on GitHub LinkedIn Facebook Twitter uh, you can reach out to me via email then and uh, last quote, we can only see short a distance. We can only see a short distance ahead. But we can see plenty there that needs to be done. I work as a data scientist at Ring Central. I work in AI, in the field of AI now for at least three years pa lang. Since I graduated ko lang ng 29. Pero nakikita ko na marami pang dapat gawin. Marami pang issues that can be involved. Ang dami nagsasabi na AI will take over the world, will take over humanity. I can assure you guys that it's not. It's not that smart yet. It's not that advanced yet for me. Ah. So, yeah. So, right now, uh, madami pang pwedeng gawin, madami pang pwedeng i-apply. Even organization and businesses, hindi lahat AI, hindi lahat nag AI, nag data science. So, madami pang pwedeng gawin in our field. And honestly, um, if you guys want to venture in this field, walang problema. Ayun nga, there's just some need determination as long as you are determined to learn data science with it. You are determined to learn machine learning, the maths behind it. Kasi it took me at least a year in college, like buong fourth year ko, I allocated it to learn this since I really want to pursue it in this field. Kasi dati hindi naman talaga ako marunong mag-math. I even hate math. Hindi ka pa ako bumaksak sa statistics subject ko ng college. Pero... Parang for me, nakita ko kasi na if I want to get a career here as a data science or AI, I need to at least be determined about it. So in one whole year, I spent my last year in college learning all of these things. So ayun. And then, thank you. So if you guys have any questions, pwede kayo mag-comments. Nakikita ko naman sa, through the live stream yung mga comments nyo. If you guys have any questions regarding a uh, capstone, thesis, something like that, uh, flash again the slides, no contact me also. All right. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Justin, for uh, sharing with everyone that very interesting and great topic about machine learning. And pretty sure this information will be fruitful to all our uh, students, especially those who are graduating students who want to take on their next journey in the field of machine learning or AI. So right now, we are opening the floor for questions. So hello, viewers. Uh, this is the best time for you to put in your curio uh, curiosity cups because we will be um, getting your questions and ask our uh, ask our speaker to answer your questions about the session for today. Okay, so let's go over our comment section and look for sorry, oh yeah, and look for questions about the machine learning topic today. Okay. So, okay, we have one question. I think I saw one question, but before that, I think they, they have their hashtag, uh, hashtag uprise from CICTBSIT4Q or mga fourth year student. They have their, they have their own hashtags para magpakilala. Uh, sila siguro mga seniors and they have their hashtag, which is hashtag uprise. So, I think uh, they are promoting something upcoming in their school. Okay, so let's go over our comment section again for a uh, question. I think I saw one earlier. Okay, so we have one from John Carlo M. Gonzalez. Okay, so let me just remove this one. Okay, so how long would it take, for example, to build an app website that will be using machine learning? So, okay. Uh, ang hirap magbigay ng quantitative right now kasi sobrang daming processes involved. So, I think the first question would be, do you have data already? If there is data available na for you, then it's easier to 
train a machine learning to develop a machine learning model. At least for me, ah, ang, ang sa work ko, if I was I tasked to do a mach, uh, machine learning to train a machine learning model, at least two to three weeks it took me to train one. Pero na train palang yun na. Ah. Iba ang deployment side. Uh, may tinatawag kami sa field namin na MLOps, which is machine learning ops. So familiar with DevOps, kaya sabi naman MLOps. So it's how you deploy a machine learning model. So on our end, ang pinaka-use case is you deploy a machine learning model using API. So sabi mo, once na it, na-train mo na yung machine learning model mo in 2 to 3 weeks, and then gusto mo na siya i-wrap sa API, that development time to wrap it into an API with to at least take another 2 weeks or so. And also, depending on the complexity, sinasabi ko 2 to 3 weeks yung mga basic algorithms pa lang yun. Siyempre, uh, if you guys are using neural networks, katulad ng pinakita ko kanina, sobrang tagal mag-train nun, it will take you guys a month for a convolutional neural network to at least develop, tapos i-deploy niya siya rapid you know, into an API. So, API, uh, if I don't know if you guys are familiar with API, pero at least, ira-wrap mo yung machine learning model into an API call, para yung predictions, yung kunyari image, uh, ififeed mo na lang dun sa API call, dun sa request mo din niya. So, how do we wrap it into API? Ako, personally, gusto, gamit ko lagi is mga cloud technologies. Uh, AWS, Google, uh, AWS SageMaker, uh, Google Cloud Platform, yung Vertex AI nila. Uh, Microsoft Azure, I haven't used it yet. Pero ayun, uh, those two, uh, SageMaker and Vertex AI, they have some great um, prediction, ano, production machine learning uh, products there. So, nirap ko siya. And then, aside from that, once you wrap it into API, gagawin mo pa yung website mo. Like, website development ka pa. Front-end, back-end, server. So, madaming processes involved. Hindi lang siya basta-basta. So, usually, in a machine learning project, yung previous work ko, uh, mad- iba- divided lagi. Hindi, ma- hindi niya kaya isang tao yan. Kasi, kung kaya ng isang tao yan, tawag namin doon, unicorn. Alam niya na lahat. Pero, it will take at least a few months pa. Ngayon, mas, marami, mas maganda kung divided kasi pwede mo naman i-work in parallel yan. I mean, habang may nag-work sa website, may nag-develop na ng machine learning model algorithm mo. Tapos habang may nag-develop ng machine learning algorithm mo, may server ka na na nag-develop. So, ayun na. Alright, so thank you for answering that question. So, um, to wrap, uh, to sum it up, no, um, it would really take time if you want a really good working machine, uh, parang project about machine learning. So, hindi lang siya madali an talaga na parang two weeks tapos mo siya ma- pero it would be an uh, parang it would help if you have your own data na uh, data ready and then parang i input mo na siya so mas madali parang mas mabilis yung process because you have your data ready naman um compared dun sa parang mag start ka palang uh, talaga from scratch so yun okay so we have another question I don't know if it's okay to ask for this one but Ah, siguro general ano to, ah, parang general na ah, what do you call this? Parang estimation lang. Ah, sa, ah, a question from Loreto Gert, ah, Gutierrez Jr. So, magkano po sahod ng machine learning engineer? Machine learning? Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Since we're talking about salary here, okay kayo mag-alala. Buhay ka dito. <laughs> Kasi, um, sabi ko nga sa inyo, with great power, of screen salary. Charot lang. <laughs> Kasi nakita nyo, napaka-complex na mga in-explain ko kanina. Um, hindi lahat may determination or may passion towards this field kasi laging na-overwhelm with the mathematics and everything. I started, siguro ang average entry level, nag-start ako kasi when I graduated at least 20 to 25k. So, after that, nung lumipat ako ng company, it got doubled. Like, as in times two. Like more than times two pa. So isipin niyo na lang from that times two, pag magtagal ka pa sa field na to, sobrang imagine the salary na lang. Siguro yun na lang yung pwede paano ko. Kasi depende din sa company actually, pero ano kasi sa Philippines, hindi lahat since yun nga, third world country tayo, hindi lahat ng businesses ready pa for AI. Mm-hmm. Hindi lahat ng businesses available in data. Pero kasi mostly ako, Ring Central, US company kami. So, so if you guys want to be a machine learning engineer, lagi kayo magkahanap opportunities sa LinkedIn abroad. Hindi naman abroad, but rather, for example, yung mga uh, BPO, yung mga BPO kasi may mga US client set. 
So I yeah. think it's a great start din. Ako kasi, ano eh, Siri Central. Parang yung connection niya din sa BTO. Connected din siya sa BTO here sa kanya. Pero ayun, yung salary, uh, kom- I'm not bragging. I think bragging rights na. <laughs> I'm not bragging, pero compared to a normal developer, ang data scientist, ang machine learning engineer, mas malaki labi ang tier nila because of the complexity of their work. Mm-mm. So ayan, so if you if you want to have a competitive salary right after you graduate, make sure to uh, parang strive to learn more about machine learning because at, uh, parang medyo mahirap yung process ng pag, ano, pag-aaral nung ano nung field itself pero very rewarding naman when you are parang you master na kung machine learning. So ayan. Okay, so thank you so much for that one. Uh, but I, 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 I'm having a uh, parang concern lang if it's okay for you to answer this question, but it's about the fake, I think. Uh, is it is it okay if we discuss this one? Okay. So we have a question from Asanti Judiel Lopez. So what is your opinion on the fake? Actually, it's more on the AI ethics. Eh? I don't really agree with using AI for the for the negative side of humanity. Kasi familiar kay Kedipe, hindi lang siya nagkakalat ng misinformation. If familiar ka kay Deep Nude, parang, so yun yung medyo naging troubling application for me. Kasi given a picture ng babae na may clothes, yung ginagawa niya, pag pinasok mo sa AI, ang output niya, bare naked na na babae. So even though it's fake, syempre, pwedeng gamitin yun for misinformation. Uy, may nakalat na nudes mo. Pero hindi, hindi, hindi mo na talaga nudes yun. So, ang daming nangyaring ganun, even sa Philippines, I don't know. Uh, hindi ko talaga sabi niya pangalan ng artista, pero may isang artista na nabiktima ng deepfake. So, kumalat yung issue na yun. And minsan, right now sa AI, sobrang advanced na ng deepfake to the point na it's indi- indistinguishable. So, ang kaya na lang madis- makakadistinguish ng deepfake is yung mga experts sa uh, information, cyber security experts, information experts. Pero kasi in, if you in, pag in the human eye, if a normal person na hindi ka naman knowledgeable sa AI, minsan indistinguishable na siya talaga. So for me, against talaga ako doon kasi part of being a data scientist is also dapat hindi ka maging enabler ng mag-ganong kinds of uh, harm to people. And yun nga, madami din actually ng political season. May, may mga lumalapit sa akin, like can you create an AI algorithm that will like spread misinformation something like that. So, medyo medyo naging troubling. Of course, I declined it, pero the fact that they're willing to pay that much, wala, medyo malaking amount na yun, yung ki Cambridge Analytica din. So, si Cambridge Analytica, ay familiar kayo sa Facebook na issue. Uh, they use data science machine learning algorithms para mas maging optimize yung machine, yung mga spread ng misinformation sa TikTok din. So, parang with great power, parang nagiging responsible din kami, ako as a data scientist in our field, yung mga ibang pakilala ko din na friends in our field. Parang part talaga namin is being ethical na hindi dapat kami basta-basta mag-implement ng data science solution on our businesses, on our organization without it, without adhering to ethical principles. Actually, you have parang may code of ethics na may release Stanford on that na dapat we should follow this type of um, ethics and the standard when creating uh, AI applications. Mm-hmm. So that, uh, very wonderfully, uh, wonderfully said about the opinion on deepfakes. So it's really, ano, no, parang um, it's in the responsibility of the engineer of this, uh, or the developer really to use your knowledge wisely. So if you use it for spreading fake news or doing parang nasty things for uh, for uh, to other people, so hindi siya ganun ka ano, hindi siya ganun ka helpful in terms of sarili mo and then sa people around you. So as much as possible, you have to be really careful kung saan mo gagamitin yung knowledge mo with regards to machine learning or AI itself. Okay, so thank you for that um uh, opinion about um the fake no and how you should be stopping or not stopping uh yeah, stopping as much as possible and prevent it uh prevent other developers to do it uh, as well to, or to practice as well, uh, as well okay so as much as we want to take in uh questions so we have our last two questions um that we will be entertaining for today so we have um uh, our first question from the last is from jjj recipe marunong din po ba sa hardware ang data science or data scientist po 
actually uh, it's related in the question and uh, earlier sa machine learning engineer um usually ang difference kasi ng machine learning engineer and data scientist is ang data ang machine learning engineer sila yung nag-optimize ng mga kung saan i-deploy yung machine learning algorithm so in terms of hardware hindi naman siguro ganun ka hardcore na micro up to the point na microcomputers pero tinat may tinatawag kasi kami sa field namin na edge computing so if familiar kay kay edge computing parang IoT nga so yung sinabi ni Seiji kanina na AI can help IoT devices so isipin mo ang laki ng neural networks nakita niyo kanina how deep 152 layers pag kinonvert mo yun into files sobrang laki ngayon yung mga IoT devices na yan um Sipin mo lang kung ang liit lang nung hardware nung, so, nung hardware capacity nila, nung storage capacity, paano na-optimize? Yung trabaho ng machine learning engineers. Ina-optimize nila yung algorithm, pinapaliit nila. Hindi naman, may nag-sacrifice ng konti kasi if, if pinaliit mo yung machine learning algorithm, na-sacrifice yung konti accuracy. Pero may balance naman on that. So ginagawa ng machine learning engineers is pinapaliit nila yung model to the point na dapat magkakasya sa, sa hardware natin. So, may yung cowork ko dati on my first company parang yung nilipatan yung company is more on the edge computing side so pinendeploy nila yung machine learning algorithm sa mga CCTV cameras sa mga IoT devices so parang ang limit ka nga nun, dapat yung file size mo lang ata was like 30 MB so 30 MB for a convolutional neural network for a neural network is very small so imagine paano nila yung pagkakasya so ang daming optimization na nangyari so I think nandun yung side ng hardware pero mostly program programmer ka pa rin kasi ito code more on coding din yun eh yung optimize the machine learning through code pero yun nga uh, aside from that you connect it dun sa Arduino sa IoT mo sa CCTV camera something like that Alright. So, thank you so much for answering that question. So, it's really true naman na parang hindi ka naman dead limited dun sa uh, yung ginagawa mo right now kasi ano yan eh parang connected talaga siya sa lahat eh hindi pwedeng nagko-code ka lang and yun lang yung parang focus mo. Although yun yung yun yung job mo, you you are uh, putting algorithm dun sa mga hardware, but you really have to know kung paano siya ma-optimize na hindi mag-overload yung hardware nung uh, pinag i mo ng algorithm mo. So yan, so we have our last question from Loreto uh, Gutierrez again. So any roadmap to learn po to be ML engineer and what is the difference between AI and ML in terms of application and real projects? In terms of application kasi, uh, if you if you guys are graduating and can work, pagdating sa AI and ML, pagdating sa businesses, parehas na lang sila ng mga isip dyan. Para AI is ML and ML is AI. Pero in theory kasi magkaibang AI and ML. Parang ML kasi, you use data to get a machine learning model. Ang AI kasi, uh, dalawa yan. May machine learning, may tinatawag kang symbolic AI. So symbolic AI was that the 1970s. Before machine learning, there was symbolic AI. Symbolic AI is rule-based. Rule-based AI siya. So madaming rules involved, maraming expensive work. So yun lang yung main difference ng AI and ML. Pero in the business side, if mag apply ka, for me, parehas lang tingin ng mga ano dyan, mga businesses dyan, eh, ng mga executive dyan eh. Lalo na mga executives naman, hindi naman sila ganun ka-knowledgeable sa AI or ML. Basta alam nila, AI, ML, data science, isa lang yan, analytics lang yan. And yung answering the roadmap, before you go to ML engineering, I think it's more on you need to learn yung algorithms first. Kasi as pa, pag papaliitin mo yung model, sabi ko kanina, ang trabaho ng machine learning engineer is papaliitin yung model. Even though I'm a data scientist, but mas, parang AI engineer kasi ako sa previous company ko. So, uh, if you know how algorithms work, then kaya mo na siya i-optimize to the point na mapapaliit mo yung model. Kasi alam mo siya kung paano gamitin eh. So, you start with, like, hindi naman mastery, but grasping the concepts of the algorithms first itself. And then second is, you learn this framework. So, yung pinakita ko kanina, TensorFlow, PyTorch. And then, once you know the theory naman kasi, and you know TensorFlow and PyTorch, marami ng tricks up there on how you can optimize the uh, model itself and how you can deploy uh, the machine learning model into an API. So, aside from that, at uh, lastly, siguro familiarize yourself. If ML engineering ka, if machine learning engineer ka, I think it's most important to familiarize yourself with cloud 
AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and Microsoft. Kasi sa data scientist right now, ako, mostly, hindi ako masyadong gumagamit ng cloud. Pero if you're an ML engineer kasi, kikilanganin mo yun pagdating sa deployment mo ng machine learning model. Kasi gagamit at gagamit ka ng clouds, ng cloud computing pag ML engineer ka. Okay, so thank you so much for answering all of our uh, all of the participants' questions. So as much as we want to answer a lot of uh, all of your questions, that's it for our Q and A session. And if you need more details, you can connect with Justin after this session. So Justin, can you share with them again your slide wherein they can uh, reach to you after this session? Okay, wait, let me share my screen. Um, yeah. right here. Okay, so I think we can give it uh, around 10 seconds, good 10 seconds para mas screen cup ng mga ano, participants natin. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, they are already screen cup naman na yung, uh, yung mga references on how to reach you after this session. So again, thank you everyone for your questions and thank you Justin for answering our participants questions and of course for that very insightful presentation earlier about machine learning okay so that concludes our stack league university series um bulacan state university edition now we move on to our next uh, program in this session okay so whether you're a career shifter or a graduating student who is interested in pursuing a career in tech and would love to start a journey as a programmer or developer, our full stack boost camp or coding boost camp might be something for you. So to discuss the full stack coding boost camp, we have Haifa, um, the head of growth of Stack Trek, to discuss more about the full stack boost camp. Everyone, if today you are very interested to pursue a career as a coder in the IT industry, but isn't confident with your skills or with having zero or minimal experience, then this opportunity is for you. In the next few minutes, you'll learn about the Stack Trek Full Stack Bootcamp that trains you to become a job ready programmer in just four months. So, as you can see here, you have two options. The first one is the Co Living Bootcamp. This is the first of its kind here in the Philippines as it combines both learning and lifestyle into one exciting and rewarding experience. It means you will be living in one building with other boot campers and you will be able to leverage all of the amenities and the social experience of learning with other boot campers. And then the other option is digital. It is virtual. That means you can take this bootcamp anywhere. By anywhere, it means if you are in the province, then you can take this bootcamp at the comforts of your home. Or if you enjoy traveling, then you can also take the bootcamp while you are traveling. Now, for you to be able to understand and get a picture of what exactly are we going to do when we enter the boot camp? So let's assume that you already applied and earned a slot in the boot camp. Here in the next few minutes, you can also imagine and also experience virtually what it is like, what you will be doing, and what will be the experience like learning with Stack Trek. So the first thing that you do in your day is have the daily discussions with your trainers and peers so you since you will be building real world applications always remember that in this boot camp we focus on your practical skills the skills that you can really use and immediately practice and in your daily discussions with your trainer you will be covering various topics and the topics that you will be covering will depend based on what module you are in during that day or during that week. So remember, you are building real-world applications and the benefit here for you, especially if you have zero experience yet, is 
is that at the end of the boot camp you will already have a bunch of projects that can showcase your skills based on the real world applications that you already built so the next thing that you do after your daily discussions with your trainers and peers is that you now go on and do and complete your hands-on coding modules it also covers advanced curriculum you want to focus on the topics and the skills that is relevant today not relevant five years ago but relevant today and in the future as well so after you go through the module do the exercises learn the things that you need to learn once you hit a bump or you're having a difficulty the platform or the bootcamp has a one-on-one -on -one live trainers capability and what exactly is this so in just one click when you are having a problem with the exercises that you're doing or the project that you are doing in just one click you get connected to the next available trainer and then you will be able to chat with that trainer immediately so you can share your screen with the trainer you can code together with your trainer and you can discuss with the trainer with the challenges that you are having as you can see it's quite different because as you code together with your trainer it feels like it's very interactive and it's very personal because the trainer is focused on you as you try to learn that specific skill or try to resolve that specific challenge so here we would like to show you what it is like so here we have an example of a trainer named john and john is talking with his trainer and trying to consult the problem that he is having so on the right side there is that chat and then at the middle is you can see the code that they are working or coding together and this is an example of one of the projects from our one of our boot campers so they are building real world applications so that at the end of the boot camp again um you will have a portfolio ready that showcases your acquired skills but one of the important things that we also would like to highlight is that in this boot camp it's not just about the technologies that you learn at the start of the boot camp you are going to focus on the module that builds you your core foundation and having a strong coding foundation allows you to learn different technologies faster the full stack bootcamp has demo days so we have demo days each month and what i will show you is one of the websites built by one of the programmers and that he was able to build this website in just one month in the bootcamp so as you can see even if you have zero background the bootcamp is beginner friendly enough for you to understand and be able to build websites even if you have zero background in the stack track bootcamp the platform that you will be using is the most advanced training technology here in the philippines and the big difference here we are more focused and having you do more coding hours if you do more hands-on you are able to apply immediately the skills that you just learned the more you apply the skills the more you realize the things that you need to improve on and as you learn and apply these skills you get better and better at it there you have two options the co-living and the digital digital is virtual so you can take this one anywhere and co-living is that you will be living with other boot campers and learning at the same time now we would like to add more details on what the co-living is like so the co-living boot camp you don't have to worry about anything else but to learn and experience life you don't have to worry about spending for food anymore it is already covered also the accommodation is also included the good thing about it is that beyond just learning of course we need to live our lives 
There is a rooftop wherein if you need a breather, you can just be there, get some air. There are lounges that you can chill around. So in the co-living boot camp, it's really different than just a typical boot camp. You learn because that's the main thing that you want to do in the boot camp. But also there are in-person sessions wherein you get inspired from people from the industry. In the co-living boot camp, there are barbecue nights, movie nights, and weekend parties that you can uh, be part of and socialize. You can also leverage on the amenities and gym program. This is what it looks like to be part of the co-living boot camp. It's very different. You learn, but at the same time, you have fun. So the co-living boot camp is situated mainly around BGC and Makati. So you can imagine that if you want to also go out, it's BGC is just five minutes walking distance. And the benefits of being part of the boot camp is that we have job partners wherein we negotiated with them that if you are a graduate of the boot camp, you will have at least 25 to 30k starting salary. And this is quite high considering that you have zero experience and you are still starting out. So one of the key benefits here at Stack Track Full Stack Bootcamp is that more than just a learning, we help you accelerate your career. So don't worry about having zero experience. Don't worry about being a non-coder and you want to enter the industry. Because if you finish and be a graduate of the bootcamp, you already have guaranteed job interviews. And if you graduate at the top 30, so then you have guaranteed job offers already. There's no stopping you in getting the IT industry. As long as you are with the Stack Track Full Stack Bootcamp, then the opportunities for you is beyond just learning. It goes over to you landing your first job and landing a highly paying job as well. So here, why IT? These are just the published rates of IT today. If you have one to four years, you will be earning on average 45K monthly. If with five years, you will be earning around 80K. As you level up, let's say to senior manager, you can even go to 172,000 for your monthly salary once you are able to enter the it industry the first stop is the first step is the hardest but once you are already in over opportunities are left and right so you really have high earning potential once you are able to enter the it industry and with that one if you are interested you can apply now the link is here below. It's bit.ly slash StackTrek Bootcamp application. And if you have questions, then feel free to find us on Facebook. You can message us there. And we hope that the StackTrek Full Stack Bootcamp is one of the opportunities that you will leverage on as you enter the IT industry and land your first tech job and with that one thank you so much everyone and have a good day okay so thank you so uh, thank you so much haifa for that very informative presentation about the full stack boost camp so we will be having another info session on september 22 thursday 11 8 that's tomorrow 11 a.m you can register via beat.b slash stack trek boost camp dash sept 22 or we will be sharing it in the comment sections all right so if you have any more questions about the Stack Trek Boost Camp, uh, you may send us a message at Facebook. Uh, on Facebook, it's fb.com slash stackcheck. Okay, and for our upcoming Stack League, uh, Stack League events, we have our Stack League Challenge Novice Edition for women 
happening on September 27th, Tuesday at 6 p.m. We also have our Stack League Tech Session Fastest uh, Dev in the Cloud, J Hipster AWS Cloud9 on September 28th, Wednesday at 6 p.m. So there are plenty of opportunities for you to learn here in Stack League. Just go to fb.com slash Stack League slash events. So for you to learn more about the registration details and get the latest updates. Okay, so okay, so the Stack League Ambassador for September is still ongoing or accepting entries. You still have one week left to earn your ambassador points. So to, to earn your ambassador points, you can either refer to your friends and family or submit your blog sharing your league experience, or you can do both. Just visit bit.ly slash Stack League Ambassador 2022 for more information. And also make sure to earn your league points to unlock the challenger levels and receive the prizes. So that's all for our announcements. And of course, on behalf of Stack League team, I would like to say thank you to everybody for joining the Stack League University series, uh, Bulacan State University edition. So if you don't have a well, reminder, if you don't have your Stack League account yet, make sure to sign up now at stackleague.com and earn, of course, invite your friends and family who you think should be part of the league. So see you guys at the next Stack League event. This has been your host, King, and have a nice day, everyone. Bye!